Some may find the following disturbing. Discretion is advised. Football, it began simple enough. Line up 11 men on one side, 11 on the other. The team with the ball is the offense. The team without it is the defense. Snap the ball, you run, you collide, and you tackle. But now football is much more. No longer just a game of brawn, it's also a game of brains. This is Bare Necessities. Good evening, barflies, newcomers. Welcome to the Barroom Network. My name is Jordan Silvera. Thankful to be your host tonight. You can find me at Jordan T. Silvera on Twitter. We've got Aldo Gandia, the maestro, the president, the master of Barroom Network. You can find him at Aldo Barkeeper on Twitter. You can also find the network at Barroom Network on Twitter. Thank you so much for showing up. This is the debut of Bare Necessities. I am looking very much forward to getting into this with you all. As the heading show, this is a focus on Larry Borum, who he is as a player after his rookie year. We're going to be going into three different games, his time with against the Pittsburgh Steelers, the San Francisco 49ers, and the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle Seahawks is him playing at left tackle. This is important because Larry Borum was primarily a right tackle at Missouri. And then two games at right tackle against the Pittsburgh Steelers and the San Francisco 49ers. The reason these games were selected is I figured it would be best to show a real authentic analysis on Larry Bourne going against some of the best edge rushers in the game, in the Pittsburgh Steelers game. He's primarily going against T.J. Watt, reigning defensive player of the year. Nick Bosa in the San Francisco 49ers, number two overall pick. Joey Bosa's little brother due for a mega extension coming soon here. And then as well, dealing with rough inclement conditions in Seattle, working against former second-round pick, 10-year veteran Carlos Dunlap out of University of Florida. Super savvy. Former first-round pick LJ Collier out of TCU. And then some up-and-coming edge rushers like Rasheem Green from Seattle as well. So this is an opportunity to go into those. I want to be very clear. This is my opinion, my analysis. It does not mean that I'm right. I'm excited to go into it, explain the highlights, the lowlights, where I think Borum shined, where I think he can get better. I have a lot of hope and, and desire to see him improve. And I want to make sure that you all know I have 44 plays here to review tonight in a sequence of 18 for the Seattle game, eight for the 49ers game, and another 18 for the Pittsburgh game. Because of this, I want to make sure. I know that a lot of you, it's 10 p.m. Central time. I want to make sure I get you out of here before midnight, before the night turns into a new day. With that said, we are collecting your comments. Aldo is in the background, being the maestro. He'll answer any questions you may have, as well as starring some, so that we can get into them. In the interest of time, though, we will be going over each game going deep into the plays. Feel free to submit your comments, your questions. We will have a three-minute break in between games to answer any questions that were starred by Aldo. We'll get into it. That'll answer your questions before we break into the next one. We're going to start with Seattle, but before that, I do want to let you know that Bear Necessities is in its infancy currency currently. We are working to engage you all, find what's interesting. I want to make sure that this show is entertaining, but also educational, informative, and most of all, it needs your help. That means smashing the like button, subscribing. It also means providing true, honest, transparent feedback, analysis. I'd like to know what you like, what you didn't like. We want to hear it all. It's all fair game. And because of that, I also want to make sure, and we'll make sure to get this out on the Barroom Network Twitter, I am looking forward to connecting with you all, interacting with you. I'd like to set up a mailbag episode. What that means is you can get a hold of me. I want to make sure that my line's open. So... If you'd like, I would love to welcome voice notes. We'll take those as a form of voicemail. Questions, those can all be submitted to jackpot2123 at gmail.com. Just as it sounds, jackpot2123 at gmail.com. You can email me there, send voice notes, as well as if you'd like to be on Bare Necessities as a guest, I'd love to welcome that opportunity as well. So if you're interested in connecting, interacting, providing assistance and help and content to the show, we'd love to have you. And without further ado, let's get into it. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's start here. We are looking at the Seattle game. I want to be clear. This is what I would consider one of maybe Larry Borum's hardest games that I watched. This is a scenario that I find and believe is one that 
sure, we're looking at inclement conditions, tough weather, it's snowing. He's also playing left tackle. How much of this is really Juan Castillo's scheme? How much of it is the offense? Having to switch when Jason Peters was out playing left tackle, having to go back and forth from left to right. This game is him completely playing left tackle. So we're going to start out with play one here. As you can see, it's the first quarter, third and nine, critical passing down. The notes that I have here is we're going to start and slowly we're going to scroll back here. But I think that he handles a hump move here. The idea of a hump move is that we are essentially engaging a defensive lineman, pushing and pulling almost as a way of that's the true move, name of the move, the hump move to get past. So we're going to show you that here. Larry Borm, left tackle. I also want to point out, look at how he's already kind of in his jump kick step. He is quick to get off the line. That is something we look for in offensive linemen. So let's let it roll. You see how he's handling it there. Let's scroll back. We're going to play it nice and slow. So he's handling it there. Deals with the contact just fine. No problem. Now we have Darnell Mooney dropping a ball here. I do want to point out that this is a pass interference, though. Now going back, before we jump into play two, I also want to note that he does a good job with his balance and refitting. As he's dealing with this hump move, we'll notice that he is maintaining his balance and then refitting the hands. So I think it's an overall positive rep, and I do want to remind you all that when we're talking about tackles, this is a scenario where sometimes it's best, again here at left tackle, to have a guy that at worst, it's set and forget. He finds a way to make it work. And here we are in play two. Let's kind of jump to that here. So that's what we're looking. I apologize. Let's kind of get past play one. So on play two here, coming up, we're looking at left tackle again. So again, gets off the ball really quick. Now he does show good leverage. When I say leverage, what we're looking for is chest around the same depth as feet. We don't want to be leaning, not standing straight up, playing with pad level low. Now you'll notice that he's doing a good job carrying around the arc, but then he does get beat inside by a club and a rip. And this is somewhat of a concern. As you can see, something that I will show you in later clips that I value is the idea of a rule of three. That means that in a perfect ideal scenario, we want to have a defensive end, a defensive lineman. On one end, his core is here. The rule of three is that you should be placing your core in the middle of that if I'm the quarterback here. I want to mirror that at all times to ensure that I am always in a perfect, think of it as planets and an orbit, that we are meeting the perfect axis. And so when we jump back in here to the film, you'll notice that he is getting beat inside. That does not align with the rule of three. The edge rusher has a perfect line to get to Nick Foles right now. So as we go around there and you'll see, Cody Whitehair is actually going to bail him out, Agent 65 over here. But the way that I think Larry Borm could have fixed this is he needs a single punch. What we're noticing here that is the issue is that he will ultimately tend to throw two-hand jabs. And the unfortunate part about that is when you're out here with those two hands and you get pushed away, You've been beaten on your leverage. It's incredibly hard to refit and connect. And so the way to overcome that is punch with one. Even if it were to get swapped down, you have another. So that's the idea there. But I want to show that ultimately not a great rep, but Cody Whitehair did ultimately bail him out here. It's a group of five. It's a team game. That's okay. So that is play two. As we move along here, we're going to get to... Play three, I want to make sure that we really tighten up on this because I want to just show the get off here. So let's see. Let's pause it, and then we will play with the scrubber here. Okay. So you'll see, even, and yes, the interior linemen are not supposed to get as deep as the tackles. But something you'll notice throughout this entire stream here as we go through the games, and I have to assume that this was a Jason Peters special. What we're looking for with offensive linemen, it's a game of who's getting off first. I want to dictate the game. I want to dictate the rules. I need to make sure that I get to my spot so that I'm dictating and I can control and handle your moves and mirror with you. Larry Borum has a consistent time showing quick get off. He's one of the first out of his stance, and that is helpful in getting him to a position so that he can properly display leverage. So next thing here, as we let it roll, 
you're going to see that he does a great job carrying them out. Nice inside shoulder. And what we're saying here, and I'm going to kind of pop back in the mirror here, is when he displays that inside shoulder, so he's playing left tackle, that means that his inside shoulder is to the guard. When you show that inside shoulder, you're almost urging the edge to take the arc. It's not a desirable path to rush to go inside because he's closed it off. So that really allows him to control him around this arc. And that's what we want to see to ultimately give a couple things. One, longer time for Nick Foles here in the pocket to throw, but also room to step up as you can start to see that wide lane and gap. And while it's Nick Foles and he may not be the best quarterback at running, this is a great opportunity to imagine Justin Fields there with his 4-4 speed breaking up and out. So let's continue to let it play. Gets to the arc there, no problem. And then he is careful to make sure that he is not holding as he is getting beat at the very end of the arc. That's not necessarily a problem. Again, this is the idea of just good enough to do your job on some plays. The other guys get paid too. Let's not forget about that. No holding call. This is unfortunately a fourth and goal with the naggy play call of David Montgomery showing great hands as he always does, but short of the sticks. Okay, moving along. So next drive here. Again, I want to show Larry Borum here. No chip help from Cole Komet. But as we go, I want you to focus on how well he does a nice job mirroring and catching Agent 94, which is Rasheem Green, on the half beat. Now, the half beat's important. I was talking about this on Dan and Aldo just a couple days ago. I, it's more of a boxing term, but the idea is if we're in a rhythm and I'm throwing a jab, one, two, jab, one, two, straight, the idea is we're trying to catch somebody in the half step. So as they think I'm kicking back, I'm stunning them. I'm popping them. And so he does an incredible job getting Agent 94, who is Rasheem Green, on the half step here. So again, left tackle already in a good kick stance. So he's going to basically catch 94 on the jump chop in the half beat, and that completely nullifies the rush. Out of the play. Gone. This is a situation where, hey, I protect your quarterback, left tackle. Let's make sure he doesn't get hit. Watch this. In the midair, catches him. We punish jumpers if we're left tackles, if we're offensive linemen. You're going to leave your feet. I'm going to punish you. You've been removed from the play. Goodbye. So that's exactly what we want to see from Larry Borum. All right. And then I just love this. Let's see if Marquise Goodwin, no longer with the Bears, make a little shake and bake. Okay. I'm going to pause it here because this is a great rep. Let's just immediately look how deep Larry Borum is in that kick step. I believe it's Jermaine Effetti on the other side. And Jermaine's doing a good job here too, but – Look at the defensive line. They've got maybe a half step, and Larry Borum is already getting ready to set up on his island. So that's what we love to see. So I want you to focus on that great footwork. You're also going to see him mirror exceptionally well. That's that rule of three. This comes with him having active feet. You slow those feet. You move them like they're in tar. All of a sudden, that moving defensive end is going to beat you. Let's watch how he mirrors exceptionally well with active feet. Let's see here. Okay, so we'll kind of go slow, moving the feet the whole way through. And then that, to me, sure, we'd like to see him finish, but that comes down to Nick Foles taking a little long to get the ball out. We're going to see also good leverage and hand use. He's not leaning too much. Hands are tucked in nice and tight. And then I will say, as I noted, the only thing I'd like to see here is a little more effort and finishing to avoid what almost becomes a sack. We want to keep your quarterback clean. That's your job as an offensive lineman. Keep the QB clean. And Nick Foles gets planted there because we're not finishing. That is, if we want to talk about an area of Larry Borum's game that I'd like to see improvement, we, I love this about Tevin Jenkins. This is a guy that's nasty, wants to plant you in the ground. An area of Larry Borum's game, and we're going to get into this, is run blocking. I'm actually going to show you some great run blocks in this game. And, but it's, it's always technical, but I want to see a little bit of nasty. Let's plant the guy in the ground. Let's make sure he understands this is going to be a rough game, and I'm going to take advantage of you. I'm going to find a way to drive you into the dirt and make you question if you want to line up on my side again. Okay, let's go along here. So you, he's here down here at the second and 10 marker left tackle. Again, this is entirely at left tackle. So he is going to, this is agent 52. I'm forgetting exactly who that is, but he does a great job attacking the inside shoulder here. And you're going to see this is an example of that run blocking. Now, we're talking about a team now that's moving to this zone scheme. The idea of a zone scheme is we want to go ahead and wall off defenders, get the running back to give him an option 
a lane, an alley to say, would you like to run it off my backside? And that is what we're going to see here. He takes 52 out of the play by just simply walling him off. Look at that alley here. And yes, I believe um, this may be James Daniels or Sam Mustafer needs to clean it up. But thank God for David Montgomery. And he's got a huge alley to pick up a first down. That is a good rep of Larry Borum run blocking. And this is an area of his game that I wish I'd see a little more consistency in. If there's an area I think that Larry Borum does a great job in, it's mirroring his feet, showing active feet, playing with that rule of three. What I'd like to see is more displacement in the run game. And even in that rep, we're saying he's not moving the guy a ton, but he is getting in the way, saying, hey, Monty, look at it. I've got a huge alley. Run it off my backside for a first down. And if Mustafa, I believe, is the guy, doesn't allow David Montgomery to get tripped up a little bit there in the beginning, who knows if we're breaking that deeper. But an excellent job by Larry Borm there. Okay. As we move along here, doing a good job. He's getting the chip help from Komet. And then he's actually getting a stunt here. 52 was originally his guy. This is a truck stunt. 52 is actually lining up and basically going through the A-gap. Does a good job accepting the stunt, understands it, passes it off. Now, he is getting beat to the inside, and that is unfortunate. We don't want to see that as LJ Collier, Agent 91. And you're getting your quarterback killed. That is the negative of the play. But, of course, Nick Foles, being the pro that he is, gets it out to Khalil Herbert, Juice. And we get a positive gain from it. Let's go back to that. So the issue here is he's not anchoring. He does not get the chance to set his feet. And then, unfortunately, Collier is putting a shoulder, an arm, an elbow right into his inner shoulder and his inner chest to drive him back to get into Nick Foles. So that is the issue there. Now... I would like to kind of touch on this a little bit more. As I said, this is a, a truck stunt or a tech stunt. The idea here, I'm going to teach you a little bit about D-line as we go through it. So X means the end goes first. Tex means the tackle, then the end. You'll notice the tackle here going in before the end crosses over. Now, the issue here is that he is indeed fixated on 52 while still receiving the chip help. And I think that is part of the issue for why he doesn't get his anchor quick enough to deal with the stunt. Overall, not a great rep, but I wouldn't call it catastrophic. The idea here is the quarterback gets it out. Uh, Mr. Shorty saying Fields is gone on that play. Yeah, it's the reality here. And this is the only play, this is the only game that you're going to see Nick Foles in, um, unfortunately. The others are Justin Fields. But so let's go scroll it back here. As we move forward, so this is a reach block. And this is great because he's going to show some lateral quickness here to reach 94. 94 is Rasheem Green. And look at how he turns. Let's get it here. Let's scroll it back. Let's work the scrubber on this video. So he's reaching down, and I really should have my, my pen here to illustrate. But so the furthest outside lineman, or who you're seeing is Cole Komet, you're looking one man in. And watch how he turns him. Now, Mustafa, Sam Mustafa, who we all love, finds his way on the ground. Or maybe that's Cody Whitehair. It is indeed Cody Whitehair. And then we see Damian Williams cut it up. So that's another good run block rep. We're going to roll it back one time full speed so you can see it. Despite Cody White here falling down, there's enough of an alley there between Mustafer and the reach block from Larry Borum to get a first down with Damian Williams. This is what we want to see out of left tackle. If we're asking you in this wide zone scheme to reach down, you've got a three tech or a guy, a two eye. I need you to get down, reach him, and turn him around. And that is what we're seeing Larry Borum do. And again, that whole idea is get your backside parallel with the line of scrimmage so that we can have a running back shoot it off your backside. And that's what we're seeing here where Sam Mustafer walls it off, Borum walls it off, and now you have this, this valley for Damian Williams to cut it through. And that's with Cody Whitehair, unfortunately, ending up on the ground in the play. Okay. So let's continue to move along. This is another left tackle rep. I want you to show just the depth. This is, again, the whole offensive line the pocket, and yet Larry Borum's the deepest in his drop. 
That's what we want to see. Get distance, but also anchor well. So this is him carrying the edge around the block, around the arc. Now, this is Mr. Shorty. You mentioned earlier that fields would be gone. This is the Nick Foles experiment where he is trying to be gone, and he does a decent job. Now, I'd like you all to just replace Nick Foles with Justin Fields and his 4-4 speed for just a second. But look at that lane that Larry Borm creates. And old, slow Nick Foles still finds a way to get around the edge there. Again, this is sure. Would we love to see Larry Borum kicking ass, putting a guy in the ground? Sure. But what we're seeing here is sometimes I just need you to do your job just well enough. And he does a great job carrying the defensive end out of the picture here for Nick Foles to go, oh, boy, if you're going to grant me that free gift, I'm running. So this is an excellent rep by him. Now, again, as we go here, great depth by the tackles here. This is uh, Jermaine Effetti getting it done, too. So you'll see my issue here, and this is where we start to talk about leverage, is it's decent foot, his, his foot leverage. He's got his feet decently spread. But you'll notice that he has his hands wide. And what I want to show here is that he's got his hands gripping the outside of the defensive end. What that automatically means, and if we're face mask to face mask, if I've got my hands out here, that means the defensive end has my chest. And that means that if he tugs, pulls, I'm going with him. So the reality is the leverage here is the issue. Pad height, pad level creates some of that. Get lower, get those hands inside so that you can shoot and explode to make sure that you're not getting trapped. Again, these guys get paid too. I know it's hard, but this is the idea of the analysis. Let's be critical where we can. So here he is. Because the hands are in the chest, he loses his anchor, gets driven back, and then the hands push to the side, and that's a sack on Larry Bourne. This is an area where, sure, we have plenty of good reps, but this is the issue, and this starts with the pad level, leaning, getting his, giving up his chest to where he ultimately gets beat for a sack. All right. Moving along here, and we're just about halfway through. As I said, this is an 18-play sequence. So then this is this is the – I believe this is the touchdown run. If you all recall, this is Juice Herbert running for a touchdown. We're going to go back to – and I would be clear, as much as I said, this is, to me, Larry Borum's worst game at left tackle. Who knows for it, whether it's the conditions. As far as run blocking, this is some of his best. He was actually just kind of manhandling with his size, and that's one of the benefits of Borum. These, these four, three defensive ends in that Carroll three system. And so you're going to see, we talk about it time and time again, give the running back an alley to run it off your backside. Look at seven, big 75 there, big Larry, turning him around. Where are you running, Monty? Right up there, right up the alley. And what do we have? Boom, a touchdown. That is exceptional, exceptional play by Larry Moore. I want to show that from the beginning to the end. I'm just going to let it roll. Keep your eyes on 75. Watch the utter dominance as he just turns his guy around. Let me just take you out of the play, and we're going and running for six. Thank you. And that's LJ Collier, former first-round pick, TCU. Excellent. So we're going to roll it back here just to get the start of this play. Okay. Now, once again, nice depth. This is number eight, Carlos Dunlap. I believe this may be the jump. Let's see. Oh, no, this is, this is no good. This is the sack. Okay. So I want you to see that as good as that depth is, remember we said let's dictate to the defensive lineman. The issue is it's almost that he's getting so deep that the feet are nice here, well spread. Now the issue is that he's leaning and the hands are low. He's almost inviting Carlos Dunlap. Go ahead and swipe these hands away so that I can get by you. And then unfortunately brings them up too late. Let's look. He's just starting to bring the hands up when Carlos Dunlap is getting into his chest. It's almost game over there. Carlos Dunlap is savvy of a vet as they come, athletic, gets into the chest, pushes Larry Boren back, loses leverage there. All of a sudden, we lose rule of three. I'm right in Nick Foles' pocket. Thank you. And that is a sack. That is a bad Boren rep. And again, I want to be clear. These other guys get paid too. It's the fourth quarter. Tough, cold, snowy, rainy game, hard weather. It's, it's a Pete Carroll team. It's compete, compete, compete. So... I'm sure that it's tough going into the fourth quarter of this game, and he's tired, and he's worn, and it's been a, a bruiser and a beating game. So I want to give him all the benefit of the doubt for that, but at the same time, we have to be fair and call a spade a spade. That is a sack on Larry Bourne. All righty, let's move on back. 
One of these, though, actually, I, I know this exactly. So this is one play later. He gets his quarterback sacked. And no, I, he can't just make up a sack with another good rep after it. But what I like to see here is that he is getting back on his horse and moving on to the next play. You'll hear that in football all the time. One play, move, move along, don't get caught up on it. Here he is one play later, again, catching Carlos Dunlap, same savvy vet, on the jump step. Again, we punish jumpers. Oh, you want to jump jump shot me? Great. I'm going to catch you mid-step, half beat. You're out of the play. And let's just look at the – I talk about displacement. Let's look at how far that punishing that jumper, punishing Dunlap gets him past the pocket. Game over. And then Carlos Dunlap is completely displaced, tries to get back inside. Borum mirrors the entire time. I know it's blurry here. I'd, I'd work too much to try and get a clear view for you, but that is the rule of three. You can literally see it where Larry Borum is directly in axis, the middle planet there. Nick Foles is me. Borum's here right in front of me face. Then we have Dunlap here. It is perfect. That is what we're looking for in the rule of three. So we move along here. This is, oh, and by the way, this is everybody's favorite, you know, tight end that's under underperforming, not catching the ball. This is uh, Cole Komet just averaging 10 yards a catch for the year, you know. Okay, so this is fourth and one. This is a QB sneak. I get it. Everybody knows, hey, probably a QB sneak coming. But, again, I want to be critical where it's fair. I love a lot of what Larry Borum does. My issue here, and I know it's tough, you got a Jimmy Graham on the very edge, and then it's Larry Borum, one man inside of him. Ev, again, the defense knows what's coming. But your job as the offensive lineman is to get lower than them, drop your pads, and displace. Push your lineman off the ball. Get some movement, even if you're the outside guy, so that, God forbid, if the quarterback has to bounce it out, he's got room to put his head across the line. Now, we'll watch it slow here. Let's show Borum. Tries. But look at that. Immediately getting pushback. Now, again, thank God he's not the center of the guard and Nick Foles is going up the middle. But this is an issue here where, look, I get it that the defense knows, but I need you to drop those pads, get those feet moving, and instead you're getting displaced and pushed back. And then all this late kerfluffle to try and push the guy over, it's just not doing it for me. So that is the issue I have in the run game. I'd like more tenacity. Displace your man. Get them moving. All right. And this is just going to slow it down here so we can watch it again. Just immediately gets hands to the chest, hands are out, and he's getting beat. Okay. So here we are again. Now this is him getting completely beat on a spin. <laughs> it's not not pretty, and I, I believe this ends up in a nasty sack on Borm as well. Again, fourth and four, not a, not the best day for Borm. So let's just focus here. Feet are wide, base is good. Leaning a bit too much, not awful. He's not so far ahead and chest over the toes. But then he's got his hands completely out. Where again, we're using that two the two hands to punch when the idea is he can spin on you. And so when you shoot those two hands out, you're out of play, you're out of leverage. And now we see, let's see here, him getting beat completely, and he's out of the play. And now this is the type where Justin Fields makes magic against the 49ers, but the reality here is we've got, you know, a statue in the pocket of Nick Foles. And the blessing, as I said, it was almost a sack, but thank God he loses leverage on this slick field and he's out of the play. But that right there, let's be very clear. Sometimes we'll, we'll think luck, we'll think skill, whatever the case may be. That's a bad rep on Borum there. Now Nick Foles makes magic happen, and unfortunately Damian Williams can't pull it down. Okay, so we get to the, kind of the, the final inning here in the Seattle game. We'll get to your questions here in just a second. Once again, we have Larry Borum here, bottom of your screen. Now he's handling 52, Agent 52. Now the issue here is that does a good job trying to mirror. Good active feet. I want to slow it down here just a bit. So he's mirroring outside, matching him one-to-one. -one. Now the issue is, is that there we are again, leaning, throwing those two hands, not being, I mean, the very skinny base for such a big man. And because he's leaning, he ends up losing that huge inside gap. And so that's the issue is that if you're not going to mirror well, we talked earlier about having a huge alley for your quarterback. But the idea here is let's also not let the man free to wreck your quarterback as he does here. 
Still, I love this play. Though. I want to show you this because as much as this is a Borum rep, let's talk about Darnell Mooney. And I have plenty of criticism about how much Darnell Mooney is a wide receiver one. My big issue is I don't, I don't feel like he gets you a bucket at the most opportune times because he's not a hugely physical guy. But as much as I'm going to critique his physicality, this is a play that Mooney's just like, let me, let me put the whole team on my back. So let's play this. Where, why are we not? Uh, why are we not playing here? Let's roll it back. And there. And how about another? And uh, nope, still not going to go down. And yet, yeah, finally. So that is that's what you want to see out of your wide receiver. The you know this is the Bears by the media that they have such a weak wide receiver core, and Darnell Mooney's not that guy. And here he is breaking through pretty much the entire secondary of the Seattle Seahawks. All right, so 94 here on Larry Boren, bottom of your screen. So this is an interesting one because I don't know how much I fault Borum. This, mind you, this is all, I'm slowing it down for you, but this is all very quick speed. Well, once again, 94 gets his hands into Larry Borum's chest, and we've got Larry Borum here kind of touching on the helmet of 94, but overall still in good position. Now let's roll it here. And that's a tough rep. This is an example where I would tell you that ultimately, no sack, no problem. They're not always going to be pretty. But this is also what I like to see is when it's not great conditions. He's beat you inside. You had to put your hands on his helmet. Now he's kind of driving you back a bit. But do you re-anchor, refit? And that's what we're seeing here where he gets his hands back inside, establishes leverage and position on the show, on the chest pads. And then it's getting a little tough. You can see the rule of three is not being followed there. And he's got a chance at fulls. But look at how quick those feet move on this big man that Liz Larry Borum to get in position to push him out. And that is ugly. Sure, we don't want a defensive end that close sniffing around the quarterback. But that is Larry Borum finding a way to recover. And then Montgomery just making – let me just throw my shoulder into you, Bobby Wagner, and then force to not go down. All righty, so this is first and 10, two minutes left. Larry Borum here. Oh, I know exactly. This is the forced fumble, unfortunately. Well, let's roll this back a little bit. To me, this isn't so much of an issue on Borum, except that I'd like to see effort. The play isn't over until we hear the whistle. That's what we're taught as, as children playing Pop Warner. So it gets a good get off here. Forces 94 out and about. You'll see he tries that jump, ch jump chop again, jump step. Larry Borm fits him up, walks him around the arc, then starts to lose leverage. Nick Foles steps up. That's fine. But at the same time, finish the block. Especially now, I know this is tough. They get paid too. But you've got an opportunity here. You're driving into 94. I don't care what you got to do. Put your – trip his feet out from under him, throw him to the ground. But because you don't finish, this allows Nick Foles to be in a compromised position where you've got your guy falling towards his feet, and then the other guy, Carlos Dunlap, it looks like just swiping at Yak. Yeah, that's Carlos Dunlap swiping at the fumble. And we recover, but that's an issue. All right. So that is the Seattle game. We will take a brief stop here. Aldo, if you want to come in or you can just start throwing the questions out at me. But I think that it's, uh, it's a good intermission there. Um, anything that you have. Fantastic job. I'm absolutely fantastic. Um we're talking in the chat here and all of us are learning so much about Larry Barham, but also about football technique as well. And so I uh, really appreciate all the hard work that you put into grabbing those clips and presenting them to us in such a professional manner, outstanding work. So uh, let's take a look at some of the questions that we have. Cliff Victoria asks, Jordan, what do you think of Barham moving forward? And I know you're going to get to that after your, uh, next sec two segments but you want to kind of give us a uh, prelude as to what's ahead yeah i'll give i'll give cliff a little hit cliff you really try to just like hey let's shorten this up and just get to the answer and i appreciate that i think that larry borum and i i don't mean to get too sappy here about who he was but played in the sec the toughest conference in college play right tackle up against aziz ojalari bj ojalari will anderson uh, Mississippi State rushers. Anybody, I mean, anybody that was playing in the SEC, that, that's who he was going against. As a, in his last year at Mizzou, posted 0% pressures allowed. This is a guy that's, and he was playing way, way heavy. And we've heard about that, that tons of times where he was losing weight. 
this is a guy that has immense size. And the thing about him is that he moves extremely well. He's quite nimble for that size. And where that's a benefit, and I know people don't love the Charles Leno name, but the idea is you've got this big frame, which means rushers tend to have to go around you. But when you're so nimble and you're always in their face mirroring, if we can just tighten up the technique, get the hands inside, really sit sit your butt down and anchor, it becomes incredibly hard for us to get around you. And that's the thing is it's not always perfect. I, I got to be honest with you. I just showed you his worst game that we're going to get into tonight. He gave up a couple sacks. It's not always pretty. But the reality there is it's, you know, if you notice, it's all technique. It's all just little thing. Hey, don't lean so far forward. Hey, get your feet out a little bit. Hey, drop your butt. Don't, don't lean so much. If Chris Morgan, Ian Cunningham, Ryan Poles can clean that up, you've got a guy here that, as I showed you, his pass protection is pretty solid outside of the technical issues. And then as much as I'd love a real butt kicker in the run game, maybe he's not planning guys and demolishing them like Tevin Jenkins shows at Oklahoma State, but you're seeing him in those zone plays, the plays that we're going to be seeing him run this year if he's playing, where he's walling off defensive linemen and letting the running back. I mean, that's a, let's be clear, as much as he let up two sacks in that game, that Khalil Herbert touchdown run is also on his resume for that game. Yeah. He opened that alley wide open for Juice Herbert to run for a touchdown. So I really think it's not perfect. This is why he was a fifth round pick. And I know Ryan Pace talked about he was a third round pick on our boards. What The reality is that doesn't matter now. He's been drafted. But what can he do to develop? And I think that you're seeing a lot of the prerequisite tools that we need out of a tackle. Mm -hmm. Can he just really refine and piece it all together? And do you all of a sudden have a guy? And I know no, nobody, not everybody loves Charles Leno, but even if he's Charles Leno, let's not forget that that guy went to Washington, got an extension, because at the end of the day, sometimes it's just okay to just have a guy that I can sleep at night knowing he's not going to get my quarterback killed. And if that's Larry Borm's floor, which I, I really, I, I got to say, I think that's his floor. He's got a lot more potential. Yeah. That's that's something that's worth keeping on the roster. That's somebody we can work with. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you uh, mentioned uh, Leno because there was uh, some talk about Leno in the chat room. And let me see the question. There was a, a, a comparison. Let's see what did I do with it? It's a comparison to Leno uh, from one of the followers. Uh, oh, man, did I lose uh, it? Oh, yeah. J2K uh, Larson that Warren reminds me of a little more athletic version of Leno. So frustrated when Leno would miss his pass set. But Borum looks like a better version of that. It's funny that you that you you brought up Leno's name. J2K is spot on here. That's exactly the thing. Is he? It, I, I know people don't love it because he's much maligned for whatever reason. He is Charles Leno. Now that's the floor. This is a big body that can move. That played elite competition in college. This is a guy that had to. I, I want to be very clear. The Bears' offense was a mess last year. And throughout the entire Nagy era, outside of maybe Darnell Mooney, and I'm not even ready to say Cole Komet or David Montgomery, there's not a whole lot of development that took place with any single player in the Bears' offense. Yeah. And so if you're looking at this and saying, well, he has so many errors, a lot of players did. What happens if you get a competent coaching staff that, I mean, we have resident stout Greg Gabriel, who's talked about, it's not a huge fan of Juan Castillo as the coach, and other players like Ross Tucker have talked about it, and so what happens if Chris Morgan's the guy and we really tighten it up? If Leno's his floor, that's acceptable. What does the upside look like? Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's like uh, you're uh, reading J2K's uh, uh, comments here, and I know you weren't because you were so focused on the tape and doing your job, but uh, J2K asked, I'm super curious of the difference in coaching from Castillo to Morgan. Seemed like Castillo wanted to set back and then latch on to the D lineman to immobilize them. Yeah, so uh, the, the idea uh, here... I'm sorry, he just goes on to say Harry Heaston was more of a one-step drop and then attack. How's Morgan going to do this? That's a great question. And, and just to be clear here, we're talking about gap schemes more related to power and duo versus zone, which you're looking at sift blocks and wide zone and plays like that. The thing is, I actually, and on a personal level, this isn't about me too much, but I, I do prefer a gap scheme, which is what Coach Castillo was trying to run. The issue with that is you do want these players – getting back quickly, get set. And I'm a firm believer in that. Don't let them dictate the rush to you. Yes, you need to tap dance. If he's going to throw a long arm or he's going to try and rip or swim, that's fine. You need to be able to adjust to that. But it helps a lot when you're there waiting 
with your feet set and planted and going, go ahead, shoot your shot, and I'm going to rebuttal. And I like that. I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But J2K is spot on here where there's a situation where you have Larry Borum sitting there, and then it's almost like – and, again, the game moves quick, especially for a rookie, where all of a sudden he's got his position, and then he gets thrown off because he's seen a move that, oh, crap, i got to adjust to that. And before he knows it, he's adjusting to that, but then the defensive lineman seeing him off balance and then, boom, bump in the other shoulder, and I'm by you. So I think to answer your question, J2K, you're going to see it a little different. Pass sets, probably not. The idea is, hey, we still need to really develop that pocket. Everybody thinks of the pocket like, hey, it's this kind of arc thing, but really we want it nice and wide. And the idea for that is, one, we're keeping rushers farther away from the quarterback. Direct pressure up the middle is the worst thing. Then as slowly as we kind of bounce out, so let's get the arc wide. And then that also opens up those lanes so that uh, Jason Peters talked about it. Like he said, hey, I have a tomahawk lane where essentially if I can get the guy out of there, Justin Fields can kind of take that tomahawk release out and up out of the lane. So that's the idea there. There was a, a question earlier. I forgot to start it, but I think it was Mr. Shorty who asked, uh, did you play high school and or college football? Uh, where did you acquire all of this knowledge? <laughs> I, I wish I could have said that I, I played for college ball, but I didn't. I went to UC Santa Barbara and got a political science degree, but I played ball from essentially five years old to the end of high school. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wish I could tell you I was some athletic running back or receiver. I, I played fullback, Mike linebacker, defensive end, and offensive tackle. I tried my hand a little. I had a cup of coffee at tight end. I Very hard position. But what I really kind of made my money on, and I was a varsity sophomore and played in varsity from that point on, is it was defensive end and then fullback. Uh, but in being a fullback, I just like the idea of I got to have a lead start and putting my, my face mask into somebody's chest and just driving them. But I always took a liking and a, and a joy, but just due to the big body size of offensive line, I think, it's a thankless position. Mm -hmm. It takes a ton of skill. Very, I mean, just, and this kind of is, is the DB. I think DB is a hard position too. And the reason for that is the other guy gets to run straight forward. He knows exactly where he's going. Yes, and he you're is. sitting here trying to be a dancing bear, dropping back, and you're, you're, you're falling backwards as you're trying to sit there and adjust your steps and keep mm -hmm. a wide base, get your hands shot in, make sure you're not holding, adjusting to, to hand fighting. I mean, there's times where you'll sit there and you'll have your hands into a guy. And he just drops a fist into the crux of your elbow and mm -hmm. it's dropped down. Like it's, it's tough play. So mm. that's, that's kind of how I got my, <laughs> my start and my knowledge in the game. And as Aldo knows and why I'm here doing this is I just, I love the game. I love talking about film. I like talking about scheme, money spending, roster building, uh, even just terminology and language and, and skill sets in schemes. You mm. know, is it, a, a, I'll give you a brief tiny bit of an example before we jump into the next film here, Aldo, mm. but, I think having five great offensive linemen is a perfect ideal world. The issue with that is I think it's too expensive to have five Trent Williams on your line. It's why even the Colts, who I love their offensive line, they had to have a Mark Lewinsky in addition to Danny Kelly and Quentin Nelson. Mm -hmm. And I know that one time they had Anthony Costanzo, but it's why they had to have an Eric Fisher there mm -hmm. because it's too hard to have five Quentin Nelsons on your team. Yes. So yes. that's why sometimes I think, how can we make the offense inexpensive? And what I mean by that is, can we get away with a guy like Larry Borum, who maybe he's not a world beater, mm -hmm. but we rest and sleep easy knowing Justin's not getting killed. Mm -hmm. And for the one or two times that Larry Borum gets beat, he's escaping. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And if we get a world beater and the pivot at, at Lucas Patrick or Tevin Jenkins or – I mean, I love Larry Borum, but even if it's Braxton Jones in two years, fine. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have an answer. And I think that's a lot of things that the media are sleeping on right now about the Bears being this worst team is just because you don't know the players doesn't mean that they can't be serviceable. Um, I've uh, got a, a number of other questions that I'll save for the end of the show because they're non-Larry Borm related, but I've got sure. one Larry Borm question before we get – it's the Steelers that are next, right? Yes, uh, which uh, is 49ers. 49ers. Um, the Borum – in preparing for the combine, uh, lost a lot of weight. He was almost a different physical player in terms of his physique than he was uh, from the tape that we saw in college. And so my question is, do you think that this uh, regimen that he went through in the offseason and preparing for his rookie season with the Chicago Bears, do you think that had some negative or positive impact on his play? 
I think it's actually positive. And I think that was part of the issue. And we heard Coach Castillo talk about it is it's awesome that he dropped all that weight, but now we're going to have him put on a few more pounds. And <laughs> look, the that. thing is some, you want, you want big mass on your offensive line. And, and this goes back to that gap and, and zone scheme. And the idea is the, we'd get so deep into the weeds and maybe we'll save this for another show. But the idea was zone in a very short version is that we almost want the entire defense running to the ball parallel to the line. It tires them out. That means that we also have to have these big dancing bears very quick with lateral agility as well. That's zone. The idea of gap and power is like, I want hogs. I want guys that are just going to bully and push people around. That's why I like it. It's just a physical brand. It beats people down. Think of the Baltimore Ravens. That's what, literally what they do for the last few years under Lamar Jackson and Greg Roman there. It's just beating the hell out of people. And so you want mass on your offensive line. The issue, and, and I mean, I'm joking here at Mama Borum, who I'm sure maybe we'll, we'll get her to see this, is she she's on Twitter all the time baking her Oreo cakes and everything that looks fantastic. And it's like, right. yeah, sure. I'm sure that wasn't the greatest for Larry Borum as he's coming home for spring break and he's eating Oreo cakes and Cinnabon and everything else. And <laughs> so the reality is, as soon as I guarantee you, he got an agent, got a trainer, and they were like, look, if you want to improve your draft stock, we mm -hmm. got to shed all that fat off. Let's get you looking lean and mean. And the good thing is you saw that he has the body for it. Mm -hmm. He can drop the weight. And I think that what you're seeing, and this is imp impressive in some ways, is despite being a little heavier, he's still moving pretty well for a guy that size. And then all of a sudden, this goes to your question, Aldo, would it be better if he lost more weight? I especially think if you're going to run zone, the fact that he was already showing that movement and speed at that size, if we drop a little more weight, he becomes more agile. Mm -hmm. And that's really the special part is if we tighten up that, 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 uh, that technique – we get him in the right position. Now, I, I have to be honest. I don't think Borum's ever going to be like just destroying people. I just don't think that's his game. Okay. But that's okay. If that's not your game, that's fine. But then let's tighten up everything else, which means if your technique is good, your feet are good, you're quick, you're agile, you're showing lateral agility, and you're fitting up on defensive linemen. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to see. I see Leo's here saying, Mom is a good cook. Grew up eating good. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to the tape. Uh, take it away. I'll go backstage and collect some more questions for you. Sure. And again, thank you everybody for tuning in. So we're going to jump right in here. This is a, I will say, I'm doing it in a little bit of a different fashion. I would almost rather save that, but this is just the way it plays out because this is a much shorter segment. This to me is what I believe to be his best game. And it's at right tackle against the 49ers against Nick Bosa. Not all of it's pretty, but I think it was his most solid collective game. And uh, that's why we're going to jump into it. And so the Pittsburgh game wasn't bad, but traditionally I like to end on a super positive note. There's plenty of positives in the Pittsburgh game. I think that was the best game of the Chicago Bears season in many ways. Uh, but we're going to get into it here with Larry Borum. So Larry Borum is going to be your right tackle, uh, top of your screen lineman, Joey Bosa. Now what they do here under, uh, boy, why am I forgetting his, D'Amico Ryans, defensive coordinator first year. They run kind of a NASCAR package. They like to have just multiple defensive linemen swapping in and out. But traditionally, you're going to see a lot of these defensive ends lining up in wide nine alignments. What that means is that a traditional defensive end, you're lining up on the outside shoulder of a defensive lineman. When you were talking wide nine, you would be traditionally almost outside of the tight end, as you're almost seeing here on the backside of it with, uh, or I should say, yeah, it's actually the weak side, the backside with Cole Komet. You're almost seeing the D lineman lined up straight on him. So again, top of your screen here, Nick Bosa, as we get into it, you're going to see that, unfortunately, I don't love his pad level here. I think that he stands straight up. Uh, and then he does, my, the big positive here, and again, this is what we're going to see a lot of, is if there's bad, he usually finds a way to correct it. He does exceptionally well recovering with his fast and active footwork, and that allows him to really mirror Nick Bosa really well, despite kind of getting standing, standing straight up and getting beat to start. Um, and you'll notice that he maintains his rule of three throughout the entire rep. And that's really what I appreciate. So let's let it roll and then we'll rewind it back. And this is all Justin Fields time. Okay. So that's the rep there to Jesse James. So I will pause as we get through it. Takes the snap. So you'll see here, it's he's dancing and he's kick stepping, which is nice. And it's, I, again, much easier said than done. And, Larry, if you see this, I get playing offensive line is tough. You're, you're trying to actively kick step, and then I'm over here, the analyst, telling you I need you to get your butt down and sink your pads. But when you're standing straight up here, it allows Nick Bosa to kind of manipulate you, where now he's into your chest, you're standing straight up, he's winning the leverage game, and he almost tries to shuck you. Now, this goes to, the, again, that mass, the recovery speed, the lateral agility, and even the power here by Larry Borm, where 
Nick Bose is trying his hardest to shuck him out of the way. And again, look at that. That's rule of three. He's still staying right there between Justin Fields and Nick Bosa. And then even then, as he's slowly starting to get beat, now again, maybe you want to call a hold here, but hey, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And Justin Fields has already got the ball out here, and there's still a couple yards of separation. That's excellent against a number two overall pick that's going to get paid very soon here. Okay, next one. This is this is funny, and the reason I love these reps because – this is the Jason Peters. I have to assume this is Jason Peters teaching these guys. Tevin Jenkins, just for record, had a great get off back at Oklahoma State, and we'll see that more as he plays. Larry Borum it wasn't a problem, but like it's exceptional here. And I and you'll notice whenever he's getting these great get offs, uh, Jason Peters is right there with him. Like let's let's try to catch this in mid step. Look at that. I mean that is that is beautiful. I, I, Justin Fields hasn't even taken a step yet. He's the guy going hike. And you've got Jason Peters and Larry Borg in a full kick step here. It's awesome. Okay. So then here we is. Bosa coming off on that wide nine. Now, this looks ugly to start. <laughs> he's leaning. He's got his one foot back, so he's not totally anchored. Uh, he's looking to get beat here. And you can see, and this is, I, I've got my camera here, so this is excellent. Something I'm going to kick a little bit of knowledge about D-line game, because as much as I'm breaking down O-line, i got to tell you, D-line is my, that's where I love <laughs> to watch film. Uh, it's it's famous, famously known by the Bosa brothers, but it's actually Larry Johnson, the defensive line coach at Ohio State, and Chase Young has this move, and it's really kind of transcending to the league. And you'll notice it. we get into it here, um, and even T.J. Watt in the Pittsburgh game tries it. It's known as like a scissors technique. And so the idea is when you get these offensive linemen leaning out with their hands, you want to chop at the elbow to get them kind of bent, and then you're ultimately just ripping around and dipping and it allows you to really kind of like turn the corner on them and bend around to get by. And you'll notice he tries to do that here, and he's in a great position because Larry Boren's elbows are straight out, leaning. So let's see how it plays out. So as I said, leaning gets the hands caught. Now this is, again, why Larry Boren shows incredible potential. Despite being in a bad position, despite leaning, not anchoring, getting his hands caught. Let's watch this. Not touching my quarterback does enough to let me sleep easy at night. And then, I mean, sure, it's uh, it's not domination. I mean, Bose is already halfway down, but at least he's getting him to the ground to say, hey, you're not touching my quarterback in this play. So that's excellent. And he uses his momentum at the end there to get him on the ground. That's the whole idea. Is Bose is that quick edge rusher that really wants to dip. And sure, you want to dip? Then I'm going to catch you at the low point and just shove you down. And that's that's beautiful. Okay, and then here we are again. I'm going to show that get off. Once again, Bosa's not even moved yet. Literally, Borum and Peters right off the ball there first. Very impressive. So it does a good job here walling off the inside. I mean, I really want to kind of focus on this because this is something I want to talk about. Is It's a term that I like to use, but when you're watching offensive line, and traditionally we'll see it more in the run game, but you want to close the elevator doors. The idea there is I want to kind of be paired tandem right there with my guard walling off the inside to say look you can try to come here but it's just going to be a problem i'd rather you go around the outside and i'll carry you past the arc and so you'll notice here despite that that first off to the kick step does a good job staying level with his guard and sure enough even though bosa tries to fake it to the inside ends up taking it out now the the thing here is and this is i guess if there's a negative point that showed up consistently in this game it was that Borum, and this is not so much Borum. It's really a Bosa thing. It's why he's a great player. It's why he's going to get paid. He loves to take advantage of guys punching. Go ahead and throw those hands out for me so I can just catch them, shove them away. You can't stop me for the most part if you can't get your hands on me. So the best way I can do it is I'll just disarm your hands and then I'm right by you. So here he is again catching Larry's hands. And he does get beat around. But again, all of that motion, that quick get off, this is what we're talking about. When he gets off quickly. He dictates the rush pattern. Because I close the elevator doors, because I shut down the inside rush path, I'm forcing you to go around the edge, which is the longer route to get to my quarterback. Then we can play these hand games all you want. But as long as Justin's not holding on to the ball forever, you're not there to do anything. Now, you can see there he's leaning and he's worrying, but luckily Justin's got it out. And then a big hit, and I, I'm sorry. I, this is, I know this is offensive line play, but and it didn't happen. He's a Denver Bronco now, but 
I love the nickel position. I love defense in general. And this is K1 Williams just laying a massive hit. This is a nickel corner. This is, we talk about lever flus with the nickel corners. This is what a nickel corner needs to be able to do. He needs to literally put his hat in the run game and watch him just lay out Herbert there. Solid tackle. Okay. So here we are again, right tackle, Nick Bosa far out there. And as we look out here, it's off again. Now, this is what I like to see. Even with the feet widened, and yes, he's into his chest, watch how well he anchors Bosa here. I mean, yeah, he's getting shoved around, but the idea is, like, he really refits. And then this, this is a play because Larry Borum does not quit. I really want to focus on that. As much as I was calling him out on effort in the past game, look at this where, yes, he gets shucked around a little bit, but does a good job getting his feet in place refitting, sitting down on his anchor. All of a sudden, uh, Justin Fields is going for the throw. Bosa and the defensive linemen throw their hands up. Larry Borum's like, okay, great. Expose that midsection to me so that I can really just sit down, punch you there, and then as long as my QB is athletic enough, which Justin is, this is Larry Borum, again, reattaching and going, I'm not going to quit on the rep. I feel my quarterback behind me. And then this is that 4-4 speed that I mean, Don Burr was here and Greg Gabriel, Greg Gabriel stream earlier talking about there are going to be 4-4 DNs that are chasing down. This is Nick Bosa. Watch who I call Ferrari Fields. Nick Bosa doesn't have a chance. That's the freak that Justin Fields is running around the corner. So excellent rep there. Once again here, taking it off. Now, this isn't Bosa. I believe this may be Arden Key. Now, the issue here is that, again, you can see the lean. 75 is leaned forward. Helmet and chin over his feet. He's still moving his feet at the time, and he's he's be, he being completely dismissed and shucked off because he's punched those hands inside. And I know this is somewhat of a, a tough issue because you hear me criticizing, saying he's constantly getting beat for his hands. He's leaning too much. You have to use your hands to punch. I understand that. But the general idea is I don't even mind if, if you're going to – grip strength is a big thing. If you're going to shoot both of those hands, then you better get them inside and not let go. But the way to really defend some of these issues where I'm leaning or they're catching both hands is if it's one hand, we're going to get that one hand here. And sure, it gets shucked away. At least I have another to start playing and slowing you down with. And this is where Tevin Jenkins, this is not a Tevin Jenkins video, but all offensive linemen and the best do this is defensive linemen are kind of like hyenas. They're just looking for bait. And so the moment that you flash those hands, it's literally called a flash technique. The moment that you flash a hand, they just, they're hungry for it. They're like, okay, I'm going to swipe the hand away and I'm going. So it almost benefit Larry Borum to use the single hand strength. You can even just, just play it. Just flash it, Larry. Just, just whoop, and then pull it back in. You may get the defensive lineman to bite on that. Now he's leaning and you can do what's called a snatch technique where all of a sudden I flash the hands. The defensive lineman shot his hands out. Now he's the one leaning with leverage out where those hands are. And I just knock them down and I just lay on them. Pancake, that's the end of the rep. So that's really what we'd like to see here. So let's jump back to the full video as we go through that. Does get beat around the edge here. This is what I was talking about where, hey, when you're leaning, you're leveraged, you're not anchoring, you get beat right around the corner here. Now this is, I mean, by the way, if I'm going to bag on Larry Bourne, let's look at all of them here. Look at the offensive linemen. They're all sitting there like, oh, crap, Justin, save us. We didn't do our job. And this is why as much as Justin Fields had a rough year, this is him making money. I mean, that's Fred Warner, guys. That is Fred Warner, the one of the best inside linebackers in the game, 54. Watch Ferrari Fields just, whoop, sucker, get out of here. And then I'm off. And, of course, ball security, Justin, let's tuck that ball in so that we're not fumbling right there. But the idea is that is a play that, I mean, I wish I could tell you Boren played better on that. But that's, that's your quarterback. That's number 11 pick overall, the guy that can make magic out of nothing. So as we move along here, let's go through here, right tackle. Does a good job staying square. Now, I love this because let's look how he, again, he's showing that inside shoulder like you're, you're going to go around here. I'm not going to open it up too easy for you. Does a good job kind of sitting there anchoring the power rush. But I mean, this is Bosa. He gets paid too. Let's make it very clear that I'm not expecting Larry Borum as a rookie to just all of a sudden stonewall him every play. But does a good job holding him up enough for fields to run out, but then, of course, the entire offensive line doesn't finish the play, and then it allows Bosa and the rest of them to get him down. Okay. So I love this because this is what we call a jump set. Now, jump setting is like some of my favorite, but it's a hard thing. It's The idea is this is kind of what J2K was talking about. Do we want them dropping back so much? 
And this isn't exactly the Harry Heastan thing of take a step and then hit them, but this is what we call a jump set. It's you literally, again, dictating the terms. I'm not going to sit here and wait for you to come to me, Bosa. I'm going to jump you and all of a sudden get out to you and force the fight right here. So this is what we see. Let's get it here. Give me just a second. Okay. So as we come here. So you'll see he backs up. I guess this is kind of that he's standing, but takes a step. But then he's jumping out to Bosa and forcing the issue right here. Now, I actually, you, we were talking about pushing your two hands out and making sure that you have a good base and punching. I guess if we want to be critical, I don't want him leaning, but it's hard to not lean when I've got my feet wide and I'm literally pushing my hands out as far as they go. So the idea here is the form on this is pretty. It's beautiful. Wide base, hands are out and into his chest. Bose is going to try again here to wrap, to, to mess with the hands and beat him. But he's got Bosa where he wants him. And again, this is not easy technique. This is him jump setting a highly athletic freak athlete, number two pick. Uh, if I've called him Joey Bosa, I apologize. Nick Bosa. Jump setting him. And this is where all of a sudden he's got him right where he wants him. Now, this is, again, Nick Bosa gets paid too. I just showed you the perfect form. And here Nick Bosa is again chopping away at those hands. And he finds a way to win. Now, again, sometimes if it's just enough to let Justin get the ball out, I'm good with it. So Nick Bosa captures the hands here, shucks them away. But then look at this. Even in a beat position, rule of three necessarily isn't looking pretty there. Look at Bosa, or excuse me, look at Borum in that big body. Find a way to still get him out of the play. That's what we want to see. All right, and then this is the last play of the game. And I've got so much to talk about on this play. And I promise I meant to make this just a Borum video, but it just leaks into other players. I guess I'll, I'll start with the... The, the thing that's not for him. Mooney is seen as a wide receiver one. I'm, I'm with it. I think he's an exceptional player. Something I talked about earlier is my big issue with Darnell Mooney and why I'm, I've been banging the table for an Alec Pierce in the draft or going to get an Auden Tate or, you know, a DK Metcalf, for God's sakes, anybody, an X receiver, a ball winner. The idea of getting a guy that gets you a bucket, gets you a play. It's the old Michael Irvin thing where Troy Aikman would know hey, I've got to get a conversion here. I just know that if I go to Playmaker, I go to 88, it's going to find a way to come down with it. That is where we were at in this game. Defense let up. This is us trying to rear back. I know we're down 11, but Justin make a play. He gives his guy in Darnell Mooney an opportunity on this play. And unfortunately, Darnell Mooney, and this is, again, a great receiver, but he doesn't possess the body type to sit up there and be a ball winner when it matters most and say, I'm going to bail you out. And this is all, if you want to talk about superpowers with Justin Fields, the thing about Justin Fields to me is that when he has his superpowers, the superpowers are that it's an ultra level of confidence. I believe in my arm. I believe in my accuracy. I believe in all of that to place the ball in a position for you to win. Now I just need you to be an all-star player and go get me a bucket. And that is where I saw this happen far too much this season where I think Darnell Mooney is best fit as a guy that let him win and feast like a Tyler Lockett. But at the same time, I still need my DK, a guy that is so physical and so fast and just forces wins at the catch point, attacks the ball. But that's what we're going to see here. But that's one segment of it. I also really want to focus on the D-line play in this clip. This is a nasty, nasty stunt um, by D'Amico Ryans. And the stunt, the, the, we're talking about front games. And if you hear me say just, they're running a nasty game here. It's all about the, the defensive front, the stunts that they're doing where we're sending guys in different paths. And so this is what we're going to call a truck on the right side. And so what you're looking for is on the right side of Borum here, that's Bosa. The truck stunt is the idea of sending Bosa on a delayed rush to go right up the A-gap because he's such a fast guy. So he's going to play with Borum here and then come up the middle. And then there's a X stunt on the left side, and that's on the Jason Peters side where the end is ducking in first and the tackle is coming around to try to confuse them. So it's a two, two man game here, two side game. Um, and the beautiful thing here is that despite it being somewhat exotic on Borum's side, the truck stunt, he actually identifies the stunt and then closes the elevator doors with James Daniels to protect the B gap. Uh, because the inside B gap is always more dangerous as we've talked about the inside of the pocket is the more direct path to the quarterback than the outside. So he closes the elevator doors there and then picks up and identifies the stunt to force 
the the tackle coming out to work the arc. So that's beautiful there. Uh, and then that, lastly, I'd like to say that just he equips himself quite well with uh, setting an anchor on uh, some people call him Arik. I call him Eric Armstead. Eric Armstead's you want to talk about like a three tech for Flusis D. Eric Armstead is that guy. That's who I love. Why I love Logan Hall. DeForest Buckner is an Eric Armstead like guy. That's why they were okay trading DeForest Buckner to the Colts. So he does a good job being a guy that identifies the stunt, closes the elevator doors, and has Armstead of all people coming across and really settling down and anchoring him here to give Fields the opportunity to launch it to Mooney. So I know it's a long wind up and setup, but there's various aspects of this play that I, I we're going to spin through this a couple times. So let's go through here. Okay. Got a unique formation here where Juice and Comet were in the backfield and then they motion them out to go empty, which – is an interesting play because hey, let's go, let's go deep here, let's try to win, but we're also going to go five man protection against a vicious D line, and that's the Nagy experience here. I know he wasn't coaching here. I know it was uh, defensive, or excuse me, special teams coordinator, but I mean that's it's just funny. Okay, so you have Bosa in the wide nine. So we go broad care sideline angle here. So you'll watch Bosa ends up kindly slipping in. And then watch that. This is the part where that's that nasty truck stunt. You'll see that. If we go back and rewind on the left side, they're actually swapping positions. You can kind of see that going now. So Bosa's ducking right in. Borum's closing the elevator doors on the inside, which only further clogs it up for Bosa, as well as making sure the rusher. And then now James Daniels has to fit up Bosa by himself. So it's all on Borum to handle Eric Armstead. And then Eric tries to spin out. And look at Borum just going, okay, I mean, I guess you could spin out, but – you weren't getting my guy. And then, unfortunately, look at 95 here. I think it's 95, getting so darn close to stripping Justin Fields here. But uh, luckily, the release is just good enough to get it out. And this is the issue here. This is when I say, like, are we sure we're ready to call him a wide receiver one? All the desire in the world, but look, this is what we're talking about. When you're the ball winner, I need you to go get me a bucket. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. But that ball is hitting your hands. Come down with it. Secure the catch extend the drive. And that is what I honestly think the Bears are missing at this moment in their wide receiver room is a guy that we know when times get tough, can I drop the ball in there and I trust you to win. Turn it into a, instead of a 50-50, an 80-20. And that was the Allen Robinson effect when he was trying to play for the Bears. And then you get Josh Norman here on the pick and he's dancing off and having a good time. So that is, and I guess I'll spin it back here just once more so I'll play it in full speed, but you can take it from any angle you want about the stun on the left side, the truck stun on the right side, the formation, the Mooney ball, whatever you'd like. But this is the final. This is kind of what becomes the final play of the game. The draw, the, the game is over after this play. But it's just exotic. This is why I love D'Amico Ryans as a defensive coordinator uh, last year, just in his scheme and really trying to bring it to a young quarterback. And so that concludes our 49ers game. That is eight plays. So let's – Pop out here. Outstanding work. <laughs> Sorry, um, I know we're an hour plus into this, but I, I promise I'm trying to go through no, as quick as possible. No, yeah, the timing wise, you're doing great. Um, I got to tell you, watching that 49ers game, those clips from the 49ers game is so heartbreaking, you know? Um, you're doing an excellent job of pointing out the. Uh, techniques of Larry Borum, but I'm just flashing back to the frustration that all of us fans felt uh, because that game should have been in the, in the bag for the Chicago bears, but uh, yeah. great work. Um, in terms of questions, we didn't have too many in that section. Um, let me see what we got here. We've got, it's interesting when J2K says that Borum needs to learn some Kung Fu. His hands are getting pulled away from him. It, J, J2K is, is funnier. It's not, not in a bad way, J2K. It's just you're often – we're almost like simpatico in our mind thoughts here because right. I, I, if, Larry, if you're seeing this, I I, am, I I admire you and respect you in so many ways. I, I Nothing against Braxton Jones. If Scopes is here, I apologize. I know some people love Braxton Jones. I'm a supporter of you. I think that you have a ton of good game and good film there, and I'm trying to show it, but I know what I'm asking is hard. It's hard to sit there and say – because it's multiple levels. I've got to have my feet and my base right. I've got to make sure I'm not leaning, but I've also got to be reactionary, but I've got to punch the hands. It, it's tough. And so when J2K is saying he's got to learn Kung Fu, he's getting his hands pulled away from him, it's It's a fine balance. And that's where what – it's a Tevin talk, but the idea with Tevin is – and people don't want to talk about this. I mean, I'll, maybe we'll do an OSU tape with Tevin. His pass protect 
technique was beautiful where of linemen to get them to play where he wants them to play. And that would put them in disadvantage, disadvantageous situations where Tevin could just finish them. That's all I think we're missing with Borum here. And I'm not sure you're ever going to see like where he's driving Joseph Osai out of the play and into the, into the coach's seat. And, but the idea is with that Kung Fu that you're talking about, J2K is he it's, he's shooting his hands, which is good, but it's either at the wrong time or the leverage isn't right. And I think some of the way that he could play that, and I could show you Missouri tape at another time. I didn't clip any of that here where he was snatching people where he's getting them to punch hands first and then dropping them down and sitting on them. And so if he could find a way to bait or flash and get them to throw their hands first Mm -hmm. and then be able to react off of that, that would help because right now he's doing a good job getting off of his spot, getting to his base, getting where he needs to be. But then it's almost he's anxious. It's like, well, I, here. And it's like, no, no, no. You're doing a good job. You're dictating. Now you've kind of you've invited him in and said, look, I started. I'm where I need to be. Your turn. Now you throw the hand, mm. and then I get to react, and I get to chop him down, or I get to swipe them away, and then push into your. It's, it's that. That's the part that's missing. Yeah. Um, interesting uh, point here from uh, Mr. Shorty. He says playing both tackle positions as a rookie impressive and so i wanted to ask you i'm 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 of that school put him on the right side or put him on the left side but let's not move him around now i know it was out of necessity but in the in the long run do you think that this was beneficial for larry borum sure i think it's all beneficial in some way shape or form because you're just learning kicking from a different angle punching getting your your depth of your kick step at different at different position different angles but I totally agree with you, Aldo. And short, Mr. Shorty's spot on here. It, is, it was out of necessity. It was impressive. And that's where I showed you what I consider to be his worst game at left tackle. I don't think that's because he'd never played a lot of right left tackle at Missouri. He was a right tackle only. And it's tough. I think a lot of that's the time of the season where the team was at. Nick Foles in the backfield. It's snowy. It's I think that was like a Christmas Eve game. And there's a lot of things going into that. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's helpful so that because if you're going to ask me kind of the what somebody will eventually ask me is do I think he should be a left or right tackle I actually would prefer him at the left and there's this I, I don't know Tevin I'm totally taking a guess here Tevin if you're listening at some point in the future but I always thought that Tevin was kind of like I want to play left because and it's not even fair but it's the idea that left tackles are the premier position and they're superior and they should be paid more and that does still exist and I get that's why Tevin that's his, his position on it but that's it's just a stupid take, and if that's really the situation that needs to be fixed, because go ahead and ask Lane Johnson. Go ahead and ask Jack Conklin. Go ahead and ask uh, – who's the cold? Braden Smith. Let's go ahead and ask the right tackles how they like dealing with Khalil Mack when he's lining up on that side. And mm-hmm. there's Nick Bosa on the right side, on the right tackle. So right tackles have to deal with it just as bad. And now with teams, it's if it's not even if I just have one edge rusher I'm moving on. A lot of teams are going, it's not enough to have one edge guy. Let's have – many let's have two let's have three where it's not just greg rousseau and aj epinesa now we got von miller to add to the mix Mm -hmm. it's not just jermaine johnson and carl lawson it's uh boy they they added uh josh martin from the texans so you have real players at both sides so it doesn't make a different where difference where he's lining up i just think in a traditional world if i'm going to go back to one traditional area i think if you were to ask me on a positional value level and this is not a hot take Mm -hmm. I think the most important position on the offensive line I have to concede is tackle, but it's not left tackle. It's not right tackle. It's the quarterback blind side. So if you've got a lefty, my most important position is the right tackle. And if Mm -hmm. I've got a righty, then my most important position is the left tackle. Mm -hmm. Keep my guy clean because he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head. So if he's pitching here and I can't see behind me, I need to make sure that's fine. And the guy that in pass pro is showing that as a rookie and who knows, because we didn't get a lot of Tevin tape was Larry was showing all the prerequisite tools there. Mm -hmm. And if we can tighten up the technique, it should be fine. And then traditionally, again, we're talking about the old traditional ideas, is the right tackle should be a guy that pass pro isn't his specialty, but he has enough of it, and he's really a good road grader. And Mm -hmm. that's the thing that Tevin does so well, is he's a fantastic run blocker. But where everybody's like, oh, so he just run blocks and he can't pass block. I actually think he's much more technical in the pass pro section which Mm -hmm. is excellent because he's still going to have to face good edge rushers 
but I want to make sure that we're building a wall to, hey, let's run the ball right. And we've got Tevin, and if it's Zach Thomas or whoever that's just building this this highway for Juice and Monty to run off of. And uh, Shorty asked, that was his first game at left tackle, right? Uh, at the Seattle game, I, I think it may have been, yeah. The Seattle game, okay. Yeah, he played, uh, yeah, I think it was. And I know he saw he saw a lot of action at left tackle in camp. Uh, uh, and then one one uh, more comment, and then we'll move on to the Steelers. I guess this is from J2K. Bosa's a true pro. Borum has a lot to learn, but he's handling his own, even though he's a rook. So great, you saw this tape. Great Borum's performance against uh, Bosa uh, uh, in that game. Honestly, and. and- if you guys can't tell this by now, my big thing is I want to be transparent and authentic. If he's having bad plays, I'm not just omitting those to tell you the hope story, and I'm not your neighborhood hope dealer. It's like the reality here is that if there's bad, I'm going to show it to you. That's a great question, and that's why I said I think that was his best game that I went through. Again, again, these are against some of the premier edges. J2K really hits that at home. Is Bosa's not a scrub. He is a real player, mm-hmm. and to me – Borum acquitted himself at like a B plus, A minus level. I mean, I, the things I can't get over is I'm watching the guy get beat by a vet with like his hands getting caught and it, everything else is still lining up in the right position to mirror him and stop him from getting to his, his guy. There was none of the nasty plays where he's getting beat on a spin or he's letting somebody right into Fields' lap. There was the one play where Fields had to break out. But, I mean, if I'm going to hit on Borum, I'm going to hit on the other guys that were on the ground looking at the backs of the San Francisco 49ers defenders. So, indeed. <laughs> I think it's a B plus and it was easily his strongest game. And J2K hit it right on the head there. Just the idea that as a rookie against one of the best edges in the game, Mm -hmm. he's showing enough. And that's why it frustrates me when we've got the Braxton Jones fan wagon. That's like, let's just throw Larry Borum to the scrap heap. This is our guy. And I'm like, the guy showed real potential in what we all know as a questionable scheme with questionable talent with, you know, bad coaching and everything else that came with it. And he's going against some of the best guys here. We're going to get into it with TJ Watt here in a second. Another, the reigning defensive player of the year. Mm -hmm. And that's the guy that he's going against. And I'm telling you, it wasn't that bad against TJ either. There was some ugly, but I'll show it to you. But with Nick Bosa, that's a top five to seven edge. And as a rookie, fifth round pick, you know, not a premier guy, was handling his own. And I think that's so impressive. Excellent. All right, let's go on to the Steelers. Sure. So let's do it. We are going to hop into the 18-play sequence of the Steelers. So let's start here. So we are looking at number 90, Agent 90. That is TJ Watt. I I think all but like one or two reps are against 90. He's got a couple on Warmly, number 95, things like that. But it's the bottom of your screen here. Number 90 is who he's focusing on. Now, he does get beat to the punch here. Um, and Watt gets into his chest, but you'll see that he does a great job refitting to establish his leverage, to reestablish the leverage, leverage and anchor. And it's sweet. So let's go ahead and watch it here. So there he is. Bosa's into his chest, pushing him back. Uh oh, this is looking bad for Larry Borum. Nope, I'm going to anchor down. You can see now he's got the leverage again. He's got his hands into the chest of, of Watt. And it's a stalemate. And Justin Fields makes magic happen where he's falling down and delivers a catch to to the running back. But just to rewind that again, I'll let it play at full speed. It's even when it looks ugly with Borum, this is what I talk about. And we showed it with Bosa. He finds a way to make sure his quarterback's not getting killed. He does a great job resetting there and anchoring. Okay. And then with step two, here he is again. And and this Jason Peters at left tackle here, yet again, taking a great get off there. He and he and Peters are first off the ball. Let that play. I love this because I will never sit here and tell you that. Uh, let me rewind it back a little more. The I will never tell you that Larry Borm's a killer on the on, at left tackle, that he's planting people in the ground. But he does a good job here winning the leverage game by fitting up on Watt. As you can see there, Watt's the guy standing up. Borum's inside of his chest. Got good leverage. Look at that base. I mean, Watt's not the biggest guy, but that's how big Larry Borum is. He's just kind of dwarfing him there. So he fits him up has his pad level, pad level lower and establishes anchor, and then finds Watt on the half beat. We talked about the half beat, like, hey, let's catch them when, when they're not ready, um, and catches them off balance and finishes them on the ground here. Uh, and this is the Hayward, Cam Hayward interception. It's just 
Like people were like, oh, Justin Fields had a negative interception to touchdown ratio. I'm like, yeah, if you saw a lot of the interceptions, they're like freaky plays. Um, and this is great awareness by Craig Ironhead Hayward, but uh, we're watching 90 here. Watch how 90 ends up on the ground here by Borum catching him on the half beat. So let's find it here. Boom, sit down. <laughs> so it's uh, it's not enough to just get in good position. This is what I hope to see more out, out of with Borum. Hey, I'm winning here. I got you. You're standing up. I'm in your chest. I'm anchoring. You're struggling. Oh, you want to separate to try to get the inside path? I'm punishing. Sit down. And that's what we like to see. And then, unfortunately, that's the Cam Hayward interception, which is just brutal. I mean, it's truly a freaking phenomenal play. And I, I think I cut this enough to where you could see the interception in real time. And it's just freaky. <sighs> I just, I was amazed when this happened. Because that's that's one on the stat book that you go, oh, Justin Fields is trash. He threw a pick. And it's like, I, what do you want them to do there? It's a uh, good play by the defense. They get paid too. So this is uh, this is 75 here. And I like this because he actually has a uh, what we call like a bucket step in the offensive line community where he's almost putting his back foot into the into a, a theoretical bucket, if you will. And this is on a naked uh, bootleg. So it's made to look like a run play. So he gets that back foot on, a, on in what we call a bucket step to then leverage up. Now, this is the ugly part. This is where I have to... I don't know. I guess it's fine in some respect. We talk about if it's, you know, didn't hurt anybody, we're okay. But it's a fake bootleg, so it doesn't hurt anybody. But let's imagine that that's actually Juice Herbert getting the ball in the backfield here. Look at Larry Borum. He's already been beat to the inside. And, yes, this is an incredible edge by uh, incredible edge player in TJ Watt. But gets caught leaning, hands in the wrong place. And then Watt is already right through. And Larry Borum's going, looking for work, going, oh, crap. Now, luckily, it's a fake, and you've got Ferrari Fields back there to deliver a super nice strike on the back, literally off his back foot, delivering a ball that, I don't know, travels 20-some yards in the uh, in the air. Really beautiful throw by Justin Fields for completion there. But just to rewind it back, sure, it didn't hurt anybody, but this is ugly. This is not what we want to see. Just because it's not going to you, I need you to block, block it like it's a run. Block it like you're not just going to get beat and look for work. Okay. So next one here, this is one where he's using good mirroring. Um, you'll see that he has good active feet and then has the hand placed. Now, this is not TJ Watt. This is Joe Schobert, um, who he uses those, those feet and his leverage to ride him past the arc, past fields. So good kick step there, maintaining a wide base. I, I want to – we're going to go through this slow, and then I'm going to play it again in full speed. I just want you to watch his, his legs chopping on the kick. It's beautiful. It's like good form. I mean, the whole time, active feet, does a good job. See, this is one where we're going to slow it down here to show you. This is what I was talking about. Hey, throw those hands a little bit, Borum, to get to get Schobert to react. Now, he actually is throwing the hands, but ends up getting them on him. And then just goes, no, let's just ride you past. And then, unfortunately, an incomplete pass. Now, I'm going to roll that back and let it play in real time. If I could ask you, just focus on his feet the entire time. His feet are just, it's like a work of art. It's what I want to see out of a big man. Just chop, 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 move those feet. And your edge rusher is never, ever in the play. Okay. So moving along here, as Justin Fields getting beat up on the, on the turf, getting pulled up in this game. My next issue here is that his pad level is, I would I, the way I wrote it here in my notes is it's meh. It's, it's not great. Um, but he does a good job fitting his hands inside. And you'll see how he washes the five technique down um, and finishes the five technique on the ground. And so I told you, I don't think he displaces a lot of people, finishes them. This is one where, for lack of I mean, a better phrase, he, he owns them. He, he lights them up and it says, like, look, I own you. Get up, get down. So watch, here he is fitting them up there. Hands are a little wide. Sure, we'd like them in. But that's that mass, that power. If there's something that I learned watching this film with Borum is he is strong. When he gets his hands on people in certain angles, he's just washing them, just pulling them down. Um, and then you'll see that with, like I said, the half beat punch on Dunlap on, on TJ Watt. And here he is. And unfortunately he ends up pushing his man into juice and that's what gets the tackle, but finishes kind of right up on top of him. And that is, like I said, I guess, yes, I can complain and say, I wish he would have found a way to, uh, you know, not get his guy in the play, but owns him here the whole time and then just throws him down. So not a bad run rep. And then as we move along here, uh, this is what I consider to be like, we want to talk about the coaching. I, I, I would say that this is a bad play action pass design. Sure. Do I think Komet and, or is it Jesse James and uh, Borum could do a better job, not bumping elbows here, but so a little bit of football knowledge when, 
we're actually running plays like this where the tight end is kicking on back. This is what you're going to, I expect you're going to see some of this with Kari Blossom game. And it's what uh, Kyle Juszczyk does with the 49ers. And uh, I keep wanting to call him Gary Gilliam, but they're Gilliam, the fullback in Buffalo. They like to run this, what I call a sift block. I'm sorry. Cause I'm skipping around here. Okay. Where are we at? Okay. So it's this next play. So they kind of bump here. It's not so awful. But so that tight end coming across, this is what's known as a split zone. He's going to commit a sift block to try and wall off any potential rushers as they pull this play action pass. But what it does against a wide nine like TJ Watt is now you're asking Borum in, in movement and space to try to fit him up, and it's really tough. And so that's that's the issue there. Now, um, he does accept chip help from Monty, and Monty, to be fair, kind of really helps him out here and saves him as he reestablishes balance and then mirrors and gets control on Watt. Um, he would have lost this rep without the chip from Montgomery. So I'm going to kind of go 50-50 blame here. Uh, I think I'm going to blame some of it on the design. It's just, hey, let's do our rookie tackle a favor. He's going against one of the best edges in the game, reigning defensive player of the year. And uh, let's make sure that we don't ask him to try to fit him up on an island and run the SIF block. But uh, Monty really saves him here. So let's rewind that just a bit. Okay. Monty saves him. And then Ferrari Fields making a play to get out of there. But I mean, again, I just want to show you some of this, like I said, it's 50 50 blame. But to me, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know how we sit there and say that this is acceptable on, on some of the play call design. It's just, it's ugly watching full speed. And then you'll see that the reason for the SIF block, and it's good. That's why you send Jesse James back there because Jimmy Graham, who is a human turnstile, does nothing to stop 56. Thank God for Jesse James on that SIF block to at least try to fit him up for a second. Justin Fields feels the pressure, and then he gets out. Okay, this is what I would consider a very solid rep. This is, again, against T.J. Watt, displays active feet, good leverage, and mirrors perfectly on Watt, like the rule of three the entire time. So let's watch this. Good kick, good get off. Again, chopping those feet. Rule of three, look at it. You can see if you were to draw a line on the play right now, you'd almost see a direct straight line to fields. Mirrors him up, catches him there. Does a good job mirroring for the most part. Fields is already in his throwing motion, delivering a strike to commit. Um, and literally damn near right in the only place he can. And Borum's out of the, or Borum's in the play. TJ Watt is out of the play. And I just love the, the, throw, the throw by Fields here. The the confidence and how much you how much fire you have to put on that throw to get it in there. And oh, look who it is! It's, it's you know Chicago Bears fans' favorite ire, the, the the tight end that apparently doesn't catch well, um, making a play there. Uh, okay, and then this is what I would say is a very heady play by Borum. He's identifying a stunt between T.J. Watt and Chris Wormley here. This is an X stunt, EX. So the end is going first. The tackle is coming in after. So he identifies that. And then picks up Agent 95, which is Chris Wormley, uh, and save to basically save Fields. Now I got to say this is this is one where you would say like, oh, it didn't really look great. I actually blame Justin Fields here, and I don't know if what chill totally should blame him. It's not a great offensive line he's playing behind, but he gets antsy and doesn't feel comfortable and ends up breaking out. But this is a really solid rep by Borm to identify the stunt, and then Wormley's not a pushover either. Big guy holds him up just fine. So there he gets a little bit of chip help from Marquise Goodwin. And I don't know why you're having your tiny slot receiver push TJ Watt, but pushes him in. Larry Borm gets caught here, pushes him. Basically, Monty fills it in and then has enough wherewithal to turn around. And I get why Fields would feel a little antsy, but part of it is like, hey, man, why don't you trust your draft to, to cover it up for you? And I know it was a late pickup, but look at it. It sits there. This is where Fields is like, I'm getting the hell out of here. But the whole time. Borum's just sitting there like, no, not, not on me, dude. Not on me. I'm keeping my QB clean. And then there's, oh, look, it's a rare sighting of Allen Robinson. Okay. Moving along. I think that this is a good example of him basically closing the elevator doors. We talked about that earlier. I almost want hips connected to the guard and the tackle here to force the outside rush lane. You'll see it, it the when he kicks out, he almost takes a step in to really secure that, and then he ends up contorting his body to almost force like you can't come in here. It's it's 
advantageous for you to take the outside rush lane. And sometimes that's what we want to see. Let's avoid giving up the inside shoulder and allowing the more direct rush lane. Okay. And then this is exactly what I mean by, by Borum where I'm sure it's third quarter. It's a tough game. You're tired, but you do a good job holding it up here. But so stay attached and finish. We're just kind of sitting here going, oh, well, the running backs past me. I'll let him go. Well, yeah, now that guy's in the pile trying to, and this is just Mon Monty Montgomery just saying, no, I'm not taking no for an answer. It's a beautiful play by Montgomery, but this is an example of where I say like, hey, man, finish the job. Now, what I laugh here is he realizes, hey, I kind of took that play off and then watch him kind of give a late shove here. But this is an example of the punch power of Larry Forum. When I say it's 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 not even like he's just doing it with malicious intent. It's just a little little shove and watch it, watch the guy go flying. <laughs> like, it's just kind of funny. I, I I appreciate that, and you'll see some of that power. Okay, moving along. I I literally just kind of paused it here, but you can see how deep both Peters and Borum are on the on the snap here. Okay, so let's move along. So this is where I I literally have marked in my in my notes here. Unbelievable get off. <laughs> So, like, hey, by the way, this is Jason Peters, the vet, the Hall of Famer. Borum's off the snap before Larry Peters. Uh, Larry Peters, Jason Peters. Peters hasn't even moved his feet yet. Larry Borum's already off. Dictating the play. Now, Watt drops out here. It does a good job kind of finding work and, and help. Guy spins out. But then Montgomery's out to release, and now James Daniels is fitting up the inside to secure it. Jason Peters is kind of getting pushed back here. But look at Larry Borum just kind of fitting it up here where – the whole time, he's in control. Does a great job mirroring, keeping his balance, feet, so that Justin Fields can deliver a strike once again to Cole Komet. Averaging 10 yards a catch, being being that player. Okay, next one. First off the line with a ridiculous get off. Like, if we were to slow that down, you'd see that it's almost the same thing. Oh, and I apologize. I keep end up scrubbing the wrong way. So we'll play that back. Promise we're almost done here. Okay, once again, unbelievable get off, getting off there. And then you'll notice once again we have the the X, or excuse me, this is a tech stunt where the tackle's coming first, then the end loops around. And he does a good job. Now, this is critical because this is one of the rare halfback screens that the Bears ran. And he knows the play and identifies, okay, fine, go ahead and go inside. You're not a danger, TJ Watt. Now, if Justin Fields gets the ball off, we're fine. I have to make sure that this guy that I'm now responsible for blocking does not get free. Otherwise, this play doesn't work. And that's a – I mean, this is the power to Justin Fields to deliver the right arm slot. As you see, just look at that angle to drop it in there just by Larry Borm's butt to get that screen off. And then it's off almost to the races. So good play there. Okay. Now, this is it's not a Borum tape, but this is, to me, there, and I'd love to engage in discussion. Down more than anything you want to point out. I, 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 we're going to do Justin Fields' analysis real quick, and then I promise we'll come back to Borum. I want you to see how this is the superpower, his confidence. He gets crushed on this play, takes a massive hit. And in the face of knowing he's going to get crushed, has the balls to throw into the scene to Jimmy Graham in two – I mean, this is the Minka Fitzpatrick's-led secondary – into two guys closing in, fits it right in on Jimmy, Jimmy Graham. There's no better throw. This is his, his best throw of the year, in my opinion. Again, it comes on play action. Sits here, gets good depth in the pocket. Look at this. I am going to get creamed by Hayward. Gets it's it's hey man, this is gonna it's not gonna be fun, you're gonna be punished. But look at him deliver it with velocity in the only place that he can. I mean, Jesus. And and the fact that I mean we don't we Jimmy Jimmy Graham is is an ire, but this is just ridiculous. It it, it does not get better than that, in my opinion. Like I just I'll, i I want to rewind that for a second. It's just I'll let it play in real time for you, but it's it's freaky. It is the best throw of the year, in my opinion. Gets cream, delivers a freaking dime. Just full belief in his arm and his confidence and, and giving his guy a chance. And you can see Jimmy Graham's there just going, going nuts. Okay, so let's get back to the Borum talk. Okay, 
So compared to the previous play action, this is the Jesse James SIF block where they're kind of connecting shoulders as they're passing each other. I think that Borum shows speed here really well to mirror and negate uh, TJ Watts wide nine. This is him at the very top of your screen where he look how far he at, is out. Cause you've got, uh, you know, Larry Borum is the third man in. So that's how far out TJ Watt is, is, is to him. And he still shows enough movement ability here too. And yes, he gets a little chip, but look at him really mirror. And then what I love about this, and I mean, we're going to talk about it. And so although if you want to throw my camera on a little bit, this is a new happy go lucky rush move in the league. And it's what's called the ghost move. And so the idea is I want to get the offensive lineman and Larry Borm shows a propensity for this. I want to get him to punch. And once the offensive lineman punches, I'm going to dip my shoulder down. So he misses the punch past me. His arm is now extended. I am close to him. There's literally damn near nothing he can do. And I'm just going to shuck under and I'm past him. Vaughn Miller is the guy that really brought this move into the league. And it's certainly not TJ Watt's finest move, but it's a savvy move that you really got to know what you're doing to do it. And Larry Borum handles it excellently. And this is again, from a wide nine, he's got to get out there. He's got to fit him in space, mirror him. It's beautiful. And he gets him right at the, at the, the arc of the pocket to do this. So let's, Go back to the full screen of the play. So as we go through here, let's play it again. I'll rewind it just a bit. Sorry, I know this is a long play, but I really think there's a lot going on here. So does a good job, Mira. You can see that rule of three where it's not perfect, but, I mean, Watt's not even close. Justin has time to set. This is him trying, trying that ghost move. And look at Borum have enough there to go, no, nope, get out of here. Not on me. And that's what gives that's part of what gives Justin Fields the time to deliver that throw. So I just think it's it's an excellent, excellent play on all accounts by Fields, by Borum. All right. And then as we go here, this is I think what I call the oh no, I actually this may be the sack that is not on Borum. I think this is a sack, and it's easy to say well, what goes on here, but this is not Borum to me. So let's see it. Decent leverage here. I mean, nobody's winning or losing at this point. Now, sure, his hands down, he's this is TJ Watt getting paid two, shoving the hand down. And sure, it's not perfect, but if Justin Fields wouldn't just duck his head and run up straight, then he doesn't get sacked by Cam Hayward and TJ Watt. So I want to be clear, that may be counted on Larry Borum. I, I'm not calling it on Larry Borum. I need Justin to trust his line a little more and make sure that he's actually identifying a lane to rush up into. And I know he thinks he has this, but I mean, have a little awareness that you got – Craig, uh, Craig, I keep wanting to call him Craig, but you have Hayward, 97, and T.J. Watt. Uh, I'm thinking of Hayward's dad, Craig. But you have Cam Hayward and T.J. Watt. And you've got to know that those guys are crashing in. Let's You've, you've got those, those wheels, Justin. Let's get onto the outside and hope that Montgomery can kind of lead up on the corner and make a play. Um, so as much as this is rough on Borum and it's rough as a result, I don't, I don't necessarily totally put this on him. Okay, moving along. So this is a semi jump set. I was talking about a jump set earlier. Um, he jump sets Watt and then does an excellent job keeping his feet moving and forcing Watt to round the, the arc, the corner. Uh, and then he also does an exceptional job negating Watt's like strong kind of rip move, uh, maybe a little holding. But you know, as I said earlier, like if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So let's go through that here. So here it is here. And I mean. Mind you, this is TJ Watt, I promise you. This is not an easy – this is with all the force in the world trying to rip through. And here he is dealing with that and finding a way. And, yeah, like I said, it's a little hold there. I mean, I get it. Like He's got his arm around TJ's neck. But if you're not trying, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And that is – I mean, sure, would I prefer him to hold it, hold it a little better against the defensive player that you're sure? But at the same time, like, hey, Justin, go make a play. I'm having a hard time here against – a killer move by one of the best step up. And then that's making a play. And unfortunately commit doesn't fit the block here. So it ends ugly. Um, okay. And then this is probably one of the ugliest plays of the game, but I really wanted to highlight it because to me, this is what I mean when I say a win is a win and it's not always going to be pretty and it's ugly. And you want a world beater who, excuse me, completely shuts down TJ Watt is a non-factor. And just, I'll let it play full speed and then I'll kind of go down in the analysis with you. 
So you can see there, and this is the, the big long strike to once again, a rare sighting from Alan Robinson. Okay. So I want you to see here, this is, this is how much force and power TJ Watt is coming off the edge with where, I mean, look at, and this is where I was mentioning all those good get offs. You can see, look at, look at TJ Watt and where he's at and his progression to where Larry Borum is. And so some of this, again, it's fourth quarter, it's late, maybe you're tired, but he's trying to chop his feet and get in position. And it's actually not bad right here. And then TJ Watt being who he is, is like, yeah, please take those hands and put them out here. And then just completely overwhelms it. But this is why even the ugliest plays Borum is, is killing. He's awesome because despite taking the leverage loss here, look at how just an unwillingness to, to give up and he's going to hit the ground here. We don't want our offensive lineman hitting the ground, stay in position to hold your block. But look at his big body and the agility moving to actually get TJ Watt down as well. And it gives Justin Fields just enough time to hit that deep ball. I mean, look at that. Borum's on the floor, but so is TJ Watt. That is, and I want to really, I'll let that play full speed once more. That is really how it's sure I would like it to be prettier, but at all means, by any means necessary, get it done. And that is, that is excellent. Okay, and then this is another one where he's sensing a stunt. Part of this is, I mean, we I, maybe I don't have the, the group in here, but Bears Twitter likes to talk about how we've had certain linemen that are too stupid to identify stunts. This is Larry Borum who showed it throughout three games here where he's sensing an X stunt that is, again, the, the end going uh, before the tackle. So you're going to see it here. End is going to drop in. And here he is identifying, okay, no, 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 this is a game. You're going too far in. Let me go ahead and re-anchor here. And then it's ugly, sure, it's getting tight. And this is where Justin Fields understands, and I, I just don't like these tight quarters. I'm going to get out. And Justin Fields, being who he is, has Marquise Goodwin wide open, but goes, hell no. I want to make a play with my feet. And then this is the touchdown where, oh, I'm just going to make a, ca a throw casually jumping in the air and delivering a strike that should win me the game, an accurate throw to Darnell Mooney. So that was the that was the touchdown. All right, and then this is good. This is another one where he's showing good get off and sets up. Uh, for an excellent balance and leverage, you're going to see that here. Active footwork, really, we've talked about how he's kind of not timing his punch as well. This is a well-timed punch um, on the half beat to handle and ultimately stonewall TJ Watt um, and his spin move to where it's almost completely uh, ineffective and it's almost looks effortless in full motion. So I'll kind of let you see that from start to finish. Um, that it's so good that like your, Monty's here to chip that Nagy understands, hey, Borum's got a tough job on his hands. Watch how beautiful this is. And this is when... This is an example of when Borum pieces it all together on a defensive player of the year. Look at this rep. I'll play at full speed and then I'll roll it down for you. Like just uh, you're out of the play. <laughs> and that's again, that's with chip help and everything. And it's just like, hey, whatever you think you're going to do here. And I apologize. I keep going back to this touchdown, but I guess it's not a thing, bad thing to look at. Good get off. Good kick step. Good wide base. Not leaning. Go on, come on in, and then look at that. I caught you on the half beat, hands to your chest. I'm pushing you out. I'm still doing a good job refitting. Feet are in the right place. You've got nothing on me, and my hands are in your chest. Where are you going? And look at Monty. Like, I guess I can help, but look at Big Larry. He's just kind of handling it. It's just that's that's beautiful. Okay, and then finally here, this is the, the final play. As much as I just gave you a beautiful rep, this is an example where Monty, who didn't have to chip on that last one, David Montgomery, his chip saves Borum's ass here. Borum is beat dead to rights if Monty doesn't come in here and save him. So I want to show you this. And then he's beat by Watt's rip move. The rip move is just a general, you're literally ripping the arm up and through. Um, you're hoping to kind of get a guy, get an offensive lineman's hands out of the way and then just ripping them up. And so he gets beat by the rip here. Uh, and then ultimately it allows Watt to singularly attack the outside shoulder uh, to get the edge and then breaking the mirroring that he's doing. So, We'll go slow, and then I'll kind of let you see it full speed. So good get off, not bad. He's already kind of leaning here, which is the issue. And then watch, that's Watt getting ready to dip, rip through. I've got your hands beat, you're turned. And if not for Montgomery, this is he's in Watt's face, or Watt is in Fields' is his face, and it's a problem. But Monty saves it here. Justin Fields steps up. And, oh, I'm just going to casually play shortstop and just contort my body and throw it to the sideline and let Kamek catch it and get out of bounds. And so that, again, I'll roll it back once more, but that is our final, our final play. 
So that is, and that completes, that is officially the, the end of the Larry Borum tape. Let's get that out of here. Ooh, I think we've got a, <laughs> I think we've got a player in Larry Borum. I, I mean, hope I've shown that. I, I really do. I, I mean, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, Aldo, please. I, I know it's a long video. Find a way to get some of this to Danny Shivin and Neil Stopchinski, who love to say we don't have tackles on the team. I, mm -hmm. I Again, I'm willing to talk about it. I'm not saying I'm right, but I, I don't know how I could have shown this and not shown real positives, some areas of improvement. And how mm -hmm. do you, I, I think you're right there. Like, we have a player. How do you see that and not think you have a player? Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, Maybe we'll have the three of you on one of our upcoming yeah. shows because we've got a lot of vehicles to have you guys do a discussion, whether it's on this show or one of our other shows. So we'll we'll make that happen. But I'm sure they'll be watching this tape uh, and uh, reevaluating some of their thinking on that. Let's go to some of the questions and comments. Uh, J2K was uh, saying that he's been doing some research on Mustafer and he's got the same measurements as Roberto Garza, 6'2", 305 pounds, 32 and a half inch arms. Not as a athletic, athletic as Garza, but he still has the size. And then he goes on to add, Mustafer was, uh, was said to lack size, but in this scheme, if he's athletic en enough to get outside, he might be all right. Your thoughts? So I think that's a good point, J2K. I think the thing that I think of is, well, first off, Roberto, Roberto Garza was an excellent player. And I mean, respect to kind of a, a guy that deserves more pub and, and recognition in his legacy. My issue with Mustafer, and I know a lot of people like to bag on him. He ended up on the ground a lot. His issue, and we'll see, part of it, the question that Aldo posed earlier is, would Larry Boren be better with less weight on his body? You know, we had that press conference last summer where Larry Boren, or excuse me, thinking Larry Boren, Sam Mustafer was talking about eating all the Lumal Nadis and pizza and upping his weight. And even despite putting on that weight, I don't know if it's just because he was slow or what the issue was, he struggled, and this is just kind of what the league we live in nowadays, you see a propensity of 3-4 teams. And the reason for that is we've now moved into a too high world, middle of the field open, too high safeties. You're removing a guy out of the box. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when teams are running at us? Well, what we can do is really find these big bodies to kind of eat up space so that even though we're conceding we're moving a man out of the box – Let's get some space eaters up in the middle and up, in, up to fit the run so that we can still live in that too high world. And that is where I think you saw Sam Mustafer really struggle is when he had to go up against the Kenny Clarks and uh, the Dexter Lawrences and trying to think of some of the other big noses in the league. And that was the issue is when he's going up against these big, powerful mountains of men at the pivot, his job all of a sudden is I have to snap the ball, identify the protection, and then somehow still fit up. That's a hard job. Now, from calling the protections – understanding and, and handling that responsibility. I know he's a smart kid. I know he probably has the will. He's already made it farther than he probably ever should have just based on pat draft pedigree and everything else. I wonder how much losing weight could help him. And then I actually just think let's get him off the pivot where he doesn't have a 400. I mean, it's, they're not 400, but they're 350, 360. And we're being Greg Gabriel was mentioning earlier. They were, we we're being nice calling him 350. Mm -hmm. Let's get the Aveas off, off of him and see if Lucas Patrick can handle that job. And then could Sam Mustafer theoretically being a smaller, more agile guy do mm -hmm. just enough, as we've said, to where you don't have to kill people out there, but can you kind of turn the wall? Can you can you get the alleyway set up? And that's the whole idea of the wide zone is we're getting the defense and the offense moving laterally and then creating these little alleyways mm -hmm. for the running back to choose. Either I can go up the front side or I can cut it back to one of these cutback lanes. And if every offensive lineman is turning to where they have their butt, faced a certain way, all of a sudden you get these lanes of that's a lane, that's a lane, that's a lane. And so if Sam Mustafer can be that guy, then you may have a little bit of uh, wow, he's kind of like Roberto Garza. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to Larry Borum, uh, sure. Bear Truth 9, who, who joined us uh, a little late. Uh, would like you to provide a short summary on why Borum can be a good starter. Absolutely. So I think that we've kind of got a very conclusive look at him versing against some of the best rushers in the league. I think he can be a good starter because on a physical level, and this is, again, let's talk about the NFL. We draft players. Sure, I, I and this is my own issue with scouting. I like to draft people that have good tape, and I'm very analytical in that way. But a lot of the times, and this is what we're talking about with even the fifth round pick and Braxton Jones and Zach Thomas and all these other guys, you're drafting for traits. Guys mm -hmm. that are, you know, maybe a little rougher on the edges, but they've got all the prerequisites that if I can just tighten it up, 
I get the right player out of it. And I think that's really what Borum's best strength is. He's a big dancing bear, very nimble and agile on his feet, big body, pretty good pass pro. I mean, sure, there's things that can be worked on, but all of the tools are in the toolbox. They just maybe aren't organized in the right way. And if we can get kind of rewire some of those issues, timing the punch, making sure you're not leaning, not standing straight up, getting good leverage, anchoring at the right point, all of a sudden you may see a guy that it's like, again, I'm not telling you he's Trent Williams, but he's serviceable. He's good. I, I sleep easy knowing I can set and forget he, he's the guy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's what I see. I see a, a good start. I, I I guess I wouldn't be a good Bears fan if I wasn't optimistic that they would hopefully hire the right guy at offensive line coach. And I mean, here's the way I would put it. And I know that this wasn't an Ian Cunningham or Ryan Poles draft pick, right. but theoretically, when you look at the situation at tackle, tackle specifically, they drafted Braxton Jones and they signed a bunch of, I don't want to say nobodies, but they're not starting quality guys in Davenport and Coleman so what that tells me is if you're going to trust anything, I'm not telling you that all of a sudden the Bears are going to win a Super Bowl, but have a little bit of faith that Ian Cunningham, who came from, in my opinion, the absolute perennial best organization that focuses on offensive line in the Philadelphia Eagles, from Jason Kelsey to Landon Dickerson to Jordan Mailata to Jason Peters to Todd Harriman's to Trey Thomas, I can go down the list. Mm -hmm. That's your assistant GM. I hope that just based on pedigree, that guy knows what he's looking at an offensive lineman. And then you have Ryan Poles, a guy that was an offensive lineman as well. Sure, they drafted Zach Thomas, Jatire Carter, Doug Kramer, Braxton Jones. But they also looked at Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borman said, we don't need to go get a Dwayne Brown or another veteran tackle, anything like that. I think that we have talent here. And I think that that's really what you've even seen expanded throughout the roster. There's not a lot of urgency and free agency at particular positions because – and, and I don't mean to jump too far off the, the basis here, Aldo, but something you were talking about earlier with, with Greg Gabriel was, is there any interest in the desire of losing now to get a better draft pick? And it's like, that's, it's just antithetical to what is in the best interest of Ryan Poles and the, the entire regime there. It's okay. in their interest. It's in their interest to win games so that the fans mm -hmm. are on their side and they're restoring success to a cherished organization. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any sense why there would be a lack of urgency to keep bad players. What that tells me is that they see the players that they have and think that there's talent there and that it was all shrouded and covered up by a dysfunctional staff in the Matt Nagy era. And if we can just kind of wipe away some of those layers of dirt and whatnot and really restore the techniques and the skill set of these players, we may have real players at these positions. And that's what Larry Borum signifies to me as well as Devin Jenkins. Mm. But, and by the way, I, I stand corrected. Uh, Bear Truth Nine was here from the beginning of the show. I assumed that he was asking that question uh, because he joined us uh, in the middle of the show or something like that. But he's been here, and he just wanted you to put a bow on the Borum evaluation. So uh, thanks for that question, Bear Truth Nine. Um, a number of questions that I can go one by one, but they all kind of lead to this question. Sure project the offensive line for uh this chicago bears team and i gotta i gotta share this one from uh shorty where is it uh um he had a, a funny one uh jones at right tackle borm at right guard and jenkins at right tackle or two right tackles what's going on here? <laughs> but anyway give us give us your thoughts on what this offensive line could look like sure and i have to give a little bit of a of an exclusion here i i will do my best i'll answer the question because i don't mind kind of playing to that but they haven't put on pads yet so right. it's a this is purely speculative it's laughable um and this is like hey tell me how good braxton jones is and it's like the guy didn't play at a major college level and he hasn't put it hasn't played an nfl snap yet so to sit there and say that's going to be your left tackle is funny to me but the pads aren't even on yet in off-season training so i think it's incredibly early but i will try <laughs> now with that being said I think if you asked me in my perfect scenario with just the pieces that we have, no J.C. Treader, no Trey, Trey Hopkins, nothing, just what, who we have, it's Larry Borum at my left tackle with Braxton Jones competing with him. If Braxton Jones wins it out, then by God, give the position to him. But sure. I'm giving the, the early lead to Borum just off of, again, this is somebody who put the work in, watching the tape, watching NFL reps, 
that guy gets a little bit of a bump just because I've seen him against some of the best rushers and I've seen something there. I have a question mark in Braxton Jones. And some people would say that question mark is worth exploring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, why am I rushing a guy in if he doesn't have to? If I have a player, Larry Boren, let me try that. So I'm going left tackle there. I see Scopes is here saying Brax left tackle book it. Good. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, so I'm going Boren at left tackle. Braxton competing with him as the backup. Left guard, Cody Whitehair, it's who we have. We're hoping he bounces back. Lucas Patrick is my center. He's a nasty dude. Like I, Maybe we should do an episode of that. You want to talk about a guy that I didn't get to show much Tevin because Tevin didn't play a lot. If I showed you Lucas Patrick film, you'd think you were watching Tevin Jenkins with how much ass he was kicking. So mm-hmm. Lucas Patrick is my center. He's the veteran calling the protection plays. Um, we're going to really – I am very excited about Lucas Patrick, but we're going to see what he's really made of because whether it was fair or not, he is a journey sixth man in the rotation in Green Bay for his entire career there. Mm-hmm. This is his opportunity to step up to the big stage and say, are you better than the sixth man? Are you an actual starting top five guy in, on a team? Mm. And so he's my center. Okay. My right guard, and this is the funny, this is like right guard gate with the Chicago Bears. Everybody <laughs> thinks right guard's this huge issue. Sure, if it was Dakota Dogier, I would probably say it's an issue. and yes in a perfect world i would actually bring a veteran in because if i'm going to tell you that i don't want to rush braxton jones in Mm -hmm. i really don't want to rush zach thomas or jatire carter in as well but we're assuming that i can't get a veteran guard Mm -hmm. so if i had it my way and i like jatire carter a lot let me be very clear but again smaller level of play hbcu we'll see what he becomes I know what I saw, and it's not – San Diego State's not the best. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I know what I saw with Zach Thomas, which was a guy that in the run game was freaky good. Mm -hmm. One of the best run blockers in the class. But as a pass blocker, I felt like there was real issues there with a lot of the same things that we saw with Borum here. And so I think this is a real thing is – I've talked about this on on Dan and all the Bear Their Souls – at right guard, I'm putting Zach Thomas, and I have Tevin Jenkins at my right tackle, and I'll touch on Jenkins here in a second. I want that wall that I can just run behind on the right side, and even if I know Zach Thomas is going to have a hard time with his pass pros, then I'm having my running back basically fill in the gap up the middle and just screen essentially, be that chip help so that if Zach Thomas gets beat, he has a backup. And then again, even then, this Lucas Patrick can help him out. Tevin Jenkins can help him out if need be. Um, so there's options there to kind of hopefully shield the pass blocking deficiencies. But as a run blocker, he's pushing people off. And that was the thing is people always ask, can we put Borum at right guard? My issue with Borum at guard is I don't see enough displacement. As big and as quick as he is, he's not a guy that is – and again, we've seen some power when he's pushing people in the back. But mm-hmm. you didn't ever really see him get under a guy's pads and just drive them off the line. And that is something that I'm going to need to see out of my guards. And so even though the pass pro is good, I think that we saw he can operate on an island in pass pro against some of the best rushers, for the most part, not perfect. And so let me go ahead and get a run blocker, a guy that I know can kick ass run blocking. I'll cover it up with some backs and some other help. And then at tackle, I'm putting Tevin Jenkins, a guy that's really going to be a tone setter at one of the edges. I can run behind him, and then I – I didn't cover it tonight, but we can talk about how I think Tevin Jenkins is a pass blocker, has some really fine technique. He he has a very good get off on the ball, does a lot like Jenkins or like Borum, where he's quick off the ball, quick off the snap. And then he'll, like I said, he'll play with the hands. He'll throw a flash technique. He'll snatch people. It's nasty. And so I really, that's my starting five. Mm. Bellissimo is in the chat. Welcome, Bellissimo. And he says, uh, that Braxton Jones didn't have great technique or coaching in college. He is super smart and super athletic, and he's incredibly long. Once he gets his pad level right in the run game, people will talk more. What do you uh, you, uh, agree with Berlissimo's take there? I completely agree with George's take there. The thing I think, George, that's important to me is – George, you're a scout or you're a guy that analyzes film. You'll know this. You remember Bruce Campbell out of Maryland? Mm-hmm. That's who Braxton Jones is to me, a guy that he has all the tools. There's no doubt about it. We draft for traits. That's why Ryan Poles probably ran that card up going, this guy's a freak. He's built like a Greek god for the tackle position. 
But as you said, it was at a lower level of competition. They actually didn't run the ball a lot, which is another issue, which is why I don't think his run blocking looked fantastic because they didn't run this ball a ton in Southern Utah. But he's got all those traits, and that's my thing. I'm not here to tell you that Larry Borum is better forever than Braxton Jones. Just right now that I give him the small edge, and I don't see a reason to rush a small school Braxton Jones, as well-spoken as he may be, as athletically freaky as he is. Mm. Take the time to really refine him. As you're saying, George, get the technique refined. Fix that run blocking. Sure, if he shows it in training camp, be my guest. I'm not here to tell anybody he can't play. But I just don't see a reason to rush a guy out there. If you truly have this freak, then let's try and give him the best chance to succeed. Mm. And I just have a hard time believing that the most successful chance is starting a rookie. Um, and I will take one quick second here. I, I noticed earlier on Greg Gabriel's show that uh, you had Nomad ask, has there ever been a left tackle to start as a rookie and be successful? The one that immediately came to mind when I saw that was Deion Dawkins. Deion Dawkins is the Bills left tackle as a rookie. I think he started like 11 or 12 games. Um, and they were a wild card playoff team that lost in the wild card. So that was a rookie left tackle in the second round that they drafted out of Temple. He's, I wouldn't say maybe a top five left tackle, but he's definitely in the top seven, top 10. He was a guy as a rookie that started for 11 games and performed admirably. I think he acquitted himself well. So it's not impossible, but I just, why do we want to stack the odds against us? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of praise in the chat room throughout uh, these two hours. I've picked out just a couple. Casey, who left us about 15 minutes ago, said, that you should be a scout for the Bears. He would love to see your breakdown of college prospects. Um, and and Mr. Shorty said the amount of work that went into this, bow down instead of bear down. Great job, Jordan. Uh, thank you both so much. And for everybody even tuning in, you're here two hours in. It's almost it's past midnight in Chicago land. I, I cannot thank you all enough, Mr. Shorty Casey. I appreciate the kind words. You're actually far too kind. I, I would love to be a scout for the Bears, but – I am small fish and I'm okay being small fish. I have a lot to learn. I'm not perfect. Again, just as a disclaimer, this is my opinion on this stuff. It doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean I have any insight to what's going on in the organization. And then to Mr. Shorty, I appreciate the kind words. This was, Aldo knows this took about a month to get this right and get the clips in order. And that's 44 clips that are notes. I have my page of notes here that we're going through and cutting those up the right way and talking about the different points of Mooney dropping a touchdown here, things like that. But it was a th true joy to go through. And I guess as we get ready to wrap up here, although I'll just leave everybody with this next week, the plan is to touch on Matt Eberflus and his defensive scheme. I know that there's a big belief that the Chicago bears are going back to lovey times where it's cover two and very basic vanilla defense. And sure. There's some of that, a lot of quarters of some cover two play, but as Greg Gabriel's talked about resident scout here at bar room, Matt Eberflus is so much more sophisticated in the defensive scheme that he's calling compared to the yesteryears of Lovey Smith. And I love Lovey Smith, but it is true. There's a lot more single high looks, rolling and rotating safeties down, blitzing safeties. And the idea is to really cut up and show those to you next week. So, although I think we have a little bit of music playing, but it's all good. There we are. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I know it's late. I'm pushing you guys. So uh, if there's any other questions or anything, I mean, again, you can find me at Jordan T. Silver on Twitter. I promise I'm an open book and always willing to take time to answer any questions. Aldo Gandia, uh, Aldo Barkeeper on Twitter, Barroom Network to follow the channel um, on Twitter. I appreciate you all for hanging out for two hours. I hope this was, again, information, informational, enjoyable, educational uh, somebody asked, was I, Mr. Shorty, was I nervous? No, I, Aldo can, I promise, ask Aldo, I wasn't, wasn't nervous. He said, I'm surprised you're so cool for having your first show. But uh, again, I thank you all for being here. And I really want to just make sure I leave it with this. Again, the show is in its infancy. We want to make sure that it continues above all my core tenets, educational, enjoyable, informational, engaging. And so if you enjoyed this, feedback's important. If you didn't, I still want to hear that. I want to know where we can get better. But again, I really, jackpot 2123, voicemails, uh, questions about the Bears, anything really. I, I know this is Bears centric, but as Aldo will tell you, I really enjoy just the game overall, the NFL. And it can be team agnostic. It can be about schemes, spending money, team building, anything of the sort. And uh, I appreciate this. Bear, or at least most of the play the Oscars. He's like, I know, I need to wrap this up. It's, it's late. Um, so 
that is that is my spiel and i hope you all enjoyed it bear down everybody thank you <laughs>